Good morning. We're going to get started now. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're pleased to have you at the joint informational hearing of the Assembly, Insurance Committee, and the Select Committee on Wildfire Prevention. At this hearing, we will be focusing on wildfire risk, resiliency, and whether these two factors can help lead to the insurance market recovery. We know these two factors alone won't solve the insurance crisis, but we would like to arm our consumers with information on how they can participate in reducing wildfire risk while also perhaps increasing the likelihood of getting coverage. We're hearing of more and more homeowners going naked which is an insurance term describing when a homeowner decides to carry no insurance coverage. This exposes our consumer's most cherished asset, their home, and it benefits no one, including insurers. Previous hearings have focused on the instability of the insurance market and what insurance obstacles this state faces. Today, we'd like to learn whether mitigation is working to reduce wildfire risk and how mitigation is viewed in the eyes of an insurer. With me today is the chair of the Select Committee on Wildfire Prevention, Assemblyman Conley, and Assemblymember Wood, who represents the Assembly District. I'd like to provide both of them an opportunity to make opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Chair Calderon. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Wood and I welcome you and our panelists to the beautiful North Bay and appreciate your leadership on this important issue. I also want to thank our panelists for being here today and members of our community who are most affected by home insurance issues and are on the front lines of the wildfire crisis. When I was first elected to the State Assembly last year, I was surprised to find that there were no committees that specifically uh, focused or addressed the issue of wildfire prevention. I'm proud that one of my first accomplishments as a North Bay's representative in Sacramento was getting the select committee on wildfire prevention created for the first time. Partnering with Chair Calderon and the Assembly Insurance Committee, it is our goal to ensure that future actions aimed at stabilizing the marketplace and expanding coverage for homeowners are done so with input and collaboration from stakeholders and members of the community. With the governor's recent executive order and the release, release of Commissioner Lara's sustainable insurance strategy, I look forward to hearing from our panelists to identify best practices and implementation strategies so that we can successfully accomplish the goals identified in these plans. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wood, my neighboring assembly member representing the amazing second district. Thank you. Okay, there we go. I was like, I used to sit up here when I was doing business with the city of Healdsburg, and I still can't figure out the microphone. But uh, first of all, thank you to uh, our committee chair, our insurance committee chair, uh, Calderon, and, and our select committee chair, uh, Connolly, for uh, being here. Uh, welcome to my world, uh, our world, uh, actually, Damon. Um, uh, and you wouldn't know it by looking at the weather today, but um, at 9.43 p.m. on October 8, 2017, was the beginning of the Tubbs fire. And uh, if, we, if we were to rewind to uh, October 9th, what you would have seen was a pall of smoke here and the hills uh, on, on fire in many places still. So this is, um, I know we didn't plan this particular date, but it is ironic and, and then and looking at the weather today, you'd never know that this, this would have happened. But, but I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. This is the first of multiple hearings. And so uh, what we don't cover today, obviously, will continue uh, because this is a very large uh, topic. So, so the people I represent in Sonoma County, Mendocino, Trinity, and Humboldt, and Del Norte counties are well-versed in the risk of wildfires. Uh, we've experienced the lack of access to affordable insurance and know very well how to make our homes safe as possible from, from wildfires. And I know there are people in the audience here today who, who, who feel that way as well. Um, we've invested thousands of dollars, uh, hundreds of hours protecting homes, yet continue to be canceled or non-renewed, uh, forced into the expensive and limited policies of the FAIR plan. Um, the triple and quadruple cost of FAIR plan policies have hit them hard, 
especially those who were on fixed incomes. Um, people have lost their homes, and in the case of the wine country fires, uh, their loved ones, um, and some, um, and actually, you know, me to a little extent, uh, suffer a little bit of PTSD every time we smell smoke around here. Um, so I've, only, I've been fortunate to have only been evacuated from my home a couple of times, um, never had a loss, but the, um, the grim reality of, of what we experienced here, the loss of 22 lives uh, in, in this county, uh, along with uh, another 20 plus in uh, neighboring counties uh, after the Tubbs fire have brought this into uh, a, a, real, a real fear for us in the long run. So we've li been living uh, with the same, uh, right, uh, as we look at uh, cancellations that have spread into uh, less obvious neighborhoods, the suburbs, we're hearing people's worry about when an, when an envelope from their insurer is gonna show up uh, in their mailbox. So we've been living with the same regulations developed in the 1980s, uh, and it's no longer the 1980s. I believe that many of the current regulatory constraints on insurers no longer apply to the, uh, to the 1980s and every Californian's long-term best interest, we, we need to consider what can be done to create a sustainable, fair, and competitive insurance market for the environment we live in today. Uh, look forward to the conversation today, but we'll emphasize that this is this the first of uh, multiple hearings here as we delve into this really, uh, really deep topic. So, and we have, I think we have another. Thank you, Assemblywoman Wood. Um, I'd also like to um, welcome my colleague, Assemblywoman uh, Diane Pappin if you want to say hi or comment. Oh, no, I'm just <laughs> delighted to be here. I won't take up further time other than to say that my shake roof was torn off this morning. So I'm here as living proof of uh, what we're doing to perhaps uh, fortify our properties. But that's not the only reason why I'm here, I promise. It's not all about me. Thank you, Assemblywoman. And uh, uh, we have another colleague who will be joining us in a little bit, uh, Assemblyman Freddie Rodriguez. Uh, so now let's go ahead and bring up our first panel. Uh, this panel will be focused on the question of how risky are California wildfires. And on this panel we have uh, Ms. Dr. Brandon Collins, Associate Adjunct Professor at the Department of Environmental Science and Policy and Management and Lead Scientist for Berkeley Forest at UC Berkeley. And we also have Dave Winnegar, Fire Chief at the Moraga Orinda Fire District. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, Thanks for having me. Um, I've, I'm not sure. I, I'm probably going to take a pretty broad perspective on this. I think you probably have some better ideas with specific, you know, um, application to the insurance. But I want to talk more broadly about wildfire in the state. And, and I'm going to start with this, this picture, um, which is of a plume from a wildfire that was in the southern Sierra Nevada. This was the Creek Fire in the year 2020. And it happened sort of outside of Shaver Lake, um, burned, you know, 300,000 something acres and lots of homes in, in, in the wake of it. But I think what I wanted to emphasize here is that a lot of people see this um, in other images like this, you know, where you, you see smoke or you see, you know, a hillside on fire. And when you couple that with sort of the, the recent nature of it, you assume right away that there is some, um, that, that this is really a, a climate driven phenomenon, that, that the only thing that explains the, the, the size of fires, the number of fires, is, is that the climate is changing and, and therefore, you know, we, we can't really do a whole lot to mitigate against that. And I want to just, you know, sort of push back on that a little bit. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and deny that, that climate is, is a player for sure, but I, I think there's, there's other um, factors at risk too. So this fire was, was, was unique, but it, there are others that we've seen that have kind of um, done something else, maybe that eclipsed this fire, but it had such incredible growth um, associated with that plume on that one particular day. You can see that in the red in the center where it grew, you know, almost, you know, 50 or 60,000 acres in a day, had a plume height of about 50,000 feet, and it just looks incredibly ominous. But what you, what you, if you knew what that fire was burning through, it sort of looked, a lot of it looked like this picture, um, where that was sort of ground zero for the, the tree mortality we saw in the drought that was um, going on 2012 through 2016. And even as quickly as, as this picture, I think, was taken in maybe 2015, um, and trees were already falling down, trees that died early on in that drought. So when you have a, you know, a fuel load like this, you have this much material that is dead, um, 
down on the ground and, and beginning that process of drying out, in some cases it has been drying out for a couple of years, it's an incredibly volatile situation um, from the standpoint of what wildfire can do. And if you have enough of it over a large enough area, you can start to contribute to that type of behavior, that, that plume that I showed a picture of. And the, the difficult thing about it is that we don't have the capability to model that type of behavior. Um, it's, it, we're still sort of rely on, on, uh, on technology that was maybe 40, 50 years old, which we've added some bells and whistles to, but we still don't actually fundamentally model the combustion of this material and then how they kind of coalesce to create something like what we saw in the Creek Fire. We saw it again, the Creek Fire is not unique and we've seen it in many others. This is the Dixie Fire and same kind of thing, plume dominated behavior. And what you, what one of the hallmarks of sort of the plume um, type of condition is that it is very much fuels driven. Now, you, you can't sit there and assume that, that climate doesn't have a role. Climate actually puts those fuels in a dry enough state where they're very available to burn, but inherently that is a fuel signature. And in the aftermath of that, you know, it's not just about the, the number of acres um, burned or, 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 I mean, in my case, the number of homes. To me, it's really about the actual effects of the fire on the ground, and in this particular case, the mortality of trees over giant scales. We're talking about thousands of acres that are treeless and don't really have um, a natural uh, mechanism for regenerating um, following that type of fire. This is completely unnatural fire for these forests. And this is part of a trend, you probably all know it, that we've seen this uptick um, in, in the, this area burn, in particular area burned at high severity where the trees are, are killed um, or, the, or whatever dominant vegetation it is, it could be chaparral, but it's killed and killed in large patches. And you can see just by some of the spiking towards the, the latter part of this, this bar graph that it seems to be coming a little more, more frequently now. And I, I would imagine that there is absolutely a climate signal in there, but a climate signal making fuel more available to burn, if you can think of it that way. And so what, why? Why are we seeing this? Um, well, we have a legacy in, in our forests of changing the structure of them um, such that they are burning very differently than they ever did historically. We've put out fires for 100 plus years in many places and been very effective at it. Um, we've also removed um, intentional ignitions. A lot of them were in indigenous um, base uh, for actually changing the structure of the forest so that they didn't burn in very severe events, but also so that they could cultivate certain amenities from the forest themselves. We've also cut from our, our trees, we've, or we've cut from our forests, in particular cut large trees. Those trees are, are generally the most fire resistant trees and as a result now we have smaller trees that are more vulnerable to fire. And, and so you know, we, we have this legacy that we kind of have to deal with. We, and we can't pretend that that's not something that, that, that we've, we've changed and, and changed in a drastic way. Right? We've, we've in many cases five times 10 times the amount of trees that are out there in the forest than there were um, historically before we started doing some of these manipulations. And so just at, if you're looking at it sort of at, at the ground level um, as this, this photograph sort of um, depicts, one, we've removed a natural process from these forests that is, that is fire that would come very frequently, oftentimes every 10 years, maybe even less in some cases, that was constantly consuming fuel that was being generated. Every year, trees are dropping needles, dropping branches, um, you know, so that's fuel that is just going, 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 and then the only thing that was taking it out was fire. We've, we've kind of changed that, um, not kind of, we've, we've really changed that, and so there's nothing else going on but maybe some decomposition, but otherwise we're, we're pretty much just accumulating fuels on the ground. We've also, by, by removing fire, have allowed these smaller trees to come in, um, and those act as something we call ladder fuels, which then allow fire to transition from the surface up into the crowns of the dominant trees. And, um, we've also increased sort of the crown fuels where now trees, even big trees, are touching big trees and when a fire does get into the crowns, it's really difficult to actually change, change its behavior because, one, um, because there is no break essentially, there's continuity um, in the upper canopy. Um, th that is at one scale, that's sort of looking at the ground. If you want to look at sort of a much broader landscape and something frankly a little bit closer to home, this is um, a comparison of uh, a giant landscape, about 130,000 acres in this particular neck of the woods, um, based on, on aerial um, imagery from the 1940s compared to aerial imagery in the contemporary time period. And what we're generally seeing is a shift, particularly in that leftmost um, set of bars, a shift towards more 
forest cover in this area at the expense of herbaceous shrub and woodland cover. So we're seeing that sort of densification, if you will. Um, it's not quite as simple of a process as we might see up in the Sierras, but in general, it's kind of trending in that same direction. And oh, I don't want to go into the second graph, but the point being that that is, is, going, is affecting some of the behavior of these fires. If you see more densely forested area, you're having more difficulty to control and perhaps um, more difficult um, or more severe fire effects potentially because of the structure of the fuels. Now, what can we do about it? I think a lot of you probably know this already, but we really have two simple tools and there's different ways and different intensities we can apply those, but we can do mechanical manipulation, right? People can call it logging, you can call it thinning, you can call it mastication, but in some way or another, it's getting machines in there and actually removing um, removing some of the biomass. Some of it you can send off on a, on a log truck, some of it you can ship and send maybe to a cogeneration plant, and a lot of it ends up frankly getting burned um, in giant piles like you see. Um, but the, the point is, in this case, what you're, you're sort of doing what fire would have done had it resumed its natural role. You're taking out some of the smaller trees, you're opening up gaps, you're leaving the bigger trees, and you're trying to, to you know, trying to, to remove some of the fuel on the surface, although mechanical means are not very effective at all, frankly, at dealing with, with the surface fuels. They can rake them a little bit or you can kind of crush them, but they're not gonna be nearly as effective as you would um, if you were to do prescribed fire. And frankly, there, there really isn't a solution out of this problem without using fire. And that's one of the problems I think we, we see broadly. It's that we can't just say we're not having fire anymore. We just need to have more of the right type of fire because otherwise without some type of fire, in this case prescribed fire, there really isn't a way to deal with that surface fuel component. It's completely unrealistic to think that we would actually physically rake the, the, the surface fuels, which by the way are constantly being added, right? Every trees are shedding needles every single year. There's no way we can deal with that other than with, than with some form of fire. So here's what, you know, this is sort of your ideal condition, what it looks like after it's been treated. In this case, it's been treated mechanically, um, where the trees have been thinned. You can see big separations um, in the tree crown, so no way that fire can move from, from crown to crown to crown, and very little in that ladder fuel strata, if you will, where the fire, even if it got into the surface, it really has no way of getting up vertically. Um, and, and so this would be your ideal treatment. Do we want this everywhere? Probably not, right? Because it comes at a cost. If you do this, you're foregoing some habitat for, for certain um, animals or even plants that, that are, are important. But the point is, if we do enough of this, we can absolutely change um, some of the behavior of these fires. Again, we won't eliminate them, but I think we can change the behavior uh, uh, of fire. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to share some of the work we've been doing. I'm Dave Winokur. I'm the Fire Chief of the Moraga Renda Fire Protection District. I also lead the California Fire Chiefs Association Wildland Urban Interface Task Force. And I'm a veteran fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford working on this issue. As Dr. Collins mentioned, there is a enormous, perhaps multi-generational effort required to restore balance to our forested landscapes. From my perspective, that is an interesting problem for people such as Dr. Collins and the Forest Service to solve. I'm more interested on the wildland urban interface, that, that point where we see a transition of fire from vegetation to vegetation, to vegetation to structure, and then structure to structure, which sets the conditions for urban conflagration. I think these two are very tightly nested because as Dr. Collins correctly pointed out, there are few if any long-term solutions to balancing our forested landscapes that don't involve the use of fire. But the use of fire, either prescribed man-lit fire or the management of naturally occurring fire is inhibited when we have non-prepared, non-fire adapted, non-resilient communities in the landscape. Managers cannot make full advantage of fire opportunities when they have concerns that a little bit of fire making it in proximity of a community could have negative impacts and they're subject to not only personal pressures where they're worried about the personal liability that assumes uh, a fire manager assumes, but they're also worried about public pressure where a community has a sense that fire should be extinguished and that fire represents a threat to their community because their community is not prepared. And the work we have been doing with the WUI Task Force is focused on how we can align the limited resources and the limited time we have available to achieve the greatest results as we seek to create fire adapted and resilient communities. Uh, I won't bear down on this slide too hard because it was mostly covered before. I will suffice it to say 
fire is a natural and recurring feature of the landscape and that some of the worst fire years we have had in 17 and 18 and 2021, we're getting into the bottom end of the range of the natural cycle. That if fire were burning in a balanced ecosystem before we began suppressing and modifying the landscape, we would see something similar to those number of acres burned every year on a recurring basis. We also have 120 years worth of exclusion of fire that we need to catch up for. So think of it as a high interest credit card with a balloon payment that has been coming due. And lastly, I would change, say from my perspective, climate change is a primary driver of wooey losses in so much as we are exposed to more of those fall wind, Diablo wind days that occur all throughout the winter. However, if they occur after the onset of seasonal rains, they're not associated with destructive fire. So the compression of the rainy season associated with, rain, with climate change means we are exposed to more of these damaging days where we have outsized impacts. This is some modeling of fire spread. And the thing I would point out here is on a wind-driven fire, and almost all of, not the largest fires, but the fires that result in the largest number of homes lost, and there's a reason those are separate lists from CAL FIRE, almost all of those fires have occurred during a fall wind event. And as you can see in the modeling here, this is by hours at three, five, and seven hour spread, the fire very quickly becomes a wind-driven fire carried by flaming embers or brands. And when those embers, brands, sparks, etc., when they land on a receptive fuel bed, they start new fires of their own, which can rapidly grow to outpace the size of the main body of fire. In a urban, an, an urbanized built environment, the fuel that is the receptive fuel bed is often a home. And when a home begins to burn, when we're in a structural firefighter setting, that is a very, very different beast than a vegetation fire. Homes burn longer, they burn hotter, and they are more difficult to extinguish because the exterior of the home sheds the water we would use to fight the fire. And it's worth noting that Chapter 7A of the California Building Code and R337 of the California Residential Code, which is our fire resistant standard, it is technically called an ember resistant construction standard. It is designed to protect homes against wind blown embers not against the sustained heat flux put off by an adjacent structure that has been ignited. So it is critically important that we recognize the degree to which our communities can be hardened against embers, but they also run the risk of a very different fire transitions into a structure-to-structure -structure urban conflagration. So to that point, we have a number of ways we can keep fire out of communities. My colleague Mark Brown from Wren Wildfire will talk about how these are being implemented just down the road here. But from out to in, they begin with distant fuel breaks, the creation of splats or modified fuel treatment areas, extended defensible space or wooey fuel reduction zones around homes themselves, the creation of defensible space to include a real zone zero where we meet the science-based five-foot exclusion of all combustible items near the home, and then home hardening retrofits for those homes that were built before 2008 and to whom the ember resistance standard did not apply, specifically the replacement of shake roofs, thank you and the retrofitting of vents to one eighth inch or finer mesh or ember resistant style that will keep wind blown embers out of the void spaces of the home. All of these systems are well understood. They're well established. The science is in. They are not subject to a great deal of debate. The challenge is, is getting our residents and our communities to adopt them at scale. And because of the concerns associated with urban conflagration, with the structure separation distance is less than 50 feet, which is almost all of our suburban areas. If one home does this work, there is essentially zero value to that work. It is not until 30% of the homes within a contiguous block have adopted these mitigations that we begin to tip the scale to actuarial significance, which then climbs to about the 85% mark. So we don't need everybody but we need a lot more than the isolated onesies and twosies that will adopt these things because they believe in wildfire risk. I believe, and as you will hear from other experts today, one of the most powerful forces we can align to encourage the adoption of these understood measures is alignment with the market's ability to price risk and access and affordability of insurance. The question I am often asked as a local government fire chief is how do I know if I do these things, my insurance will reflect these changes? I think the commissioner's recent announcement of the inclusion of forward-looking cap models as a way for rate setting is critically important because communities such as mine that have made enormous investments in wildfire risk reduction and fire suppression capability in a backward-looking historical loss model, they were unable to be credited for the work they have done. I am hopeful that the new regulations will allow these measures to be more broadly understood and more broadly adopted because if we lose fewer homes to wildfire, all of our other problems in this space get better. 
If we don't address the underlying issue, which is the susceptibility of homes and neighborhoods to wildfire and to urban conflagration, everything else we do will be ineffective. So this is a simulation showing fire spread leading into the community of Woodside. And this is speed-based, not intensity-based, which intensity-based fire modeling is, is interesting for forest management. It, however, is wildly inapplicable for the WUI problem where it is a question of relative speed. Did the fire get to the community before the firefighting response got to the community with the appropriate weight to stop the fire? And in this particular case, we see that the pathways leading into the community, the lines are speed-based pathways, the heat map is fire line intensity being used as a surrogate for ember production, but we see there are two primary points of entry into the community. And the one we're taking a look at here is on the top center of the left screen. It shows where that vegetation to vegetation pathway transitions into a neighborhood that we see inset on the right. This would be the sort of tool that would be used by a community to say this neighborhood is going to be prioritized for outreach, education, incentives, and unapologetic enforcement of either state law and SRA in the case of PRC 4291 or local regulations in LRA that can meet or exceed state law. And if we put in that combination of splats, extended defensible space, defensible space, home hardening, we can close off this pathway. And if you look at the, at the map on the left side again, you see how work done at this point of entry has an outsized impact on all of those downstream homes that would be exposed potentially to urban conflagration if fire made it past this point. So by using tools such as these, we can prioritize our limited resources with validation. This is one of many of the tools that are available for verification of work that has been done. We are moving into a space where saying that someone has done good things is probably not going to be enough. We're going to need verification with an annual update to show that the conditions that will support fire have been removed and maintained from parcels at a landscape level. This is work being done by the, California, by the Western Fire Chiefs Association that provides a wildland urban interface response rating so we can understand how many firefighters, how good will they be at each of the fire pathways, veg to veg, veg to structure, and structure to structure, and how long will it take them to get to that point so we can value the offensive and defensive actions taken by our firefighters that absolutely affect outcomes but are not currently represented in our fire spread models. Uh, these are two recent works that I, I would recommend to anyone who is interested in the topic. The one on the left, you know, the CAP models for wildfire mitigation. This is a case study done in the community of Moraga and Orinda. And then Paradise is further work that took a look at the community of Paradise and of Moraga Orinda, identified buffers around the community, and on the right side identified the average annual loss from the baseline risk. Most importantly, they then took a look at what a 2040 scenario looks like with no mitigations. And unsurprisingly, it shows the situation getting worse. And then they took a look at the value of various mitigations and found it, in the extreme example of the plus mitigation scenario that was included the creation of buffer zones around the community, defensible space and home hardening, there was up to a 65% reduction in the average annual loss for that community and a 78% overall reduction in the community's hypothetical cost to insure. I take these as an example of what can be done. The great challenge we have now is getting people to do the work and creating alignment between the fire service, our land managers, cap modelers, and insurers so that we are all speaking with the same voice with regard to how risk is viewed and mitigated. I don't claim to be an expert on pricing and wouldn't want to step into that lane, but I can say it is tremendously unhelpful in a community when as the fire chief I stand up and say you need to do this, this, and this, People do it, and shortly thereafter, they either get a non-renewal letter or they get a form letter from an insurer saying, you have tree canopy separation of less than 10 feet, therefore you will be uninsured. In a Mediterranean county in California, specifically in the Bay Area, there is no such thing as a running crown fire. Therefore, tree canopy separation is irrelevant to fire spread and to the risk of the home. It is an artifact of a one-size-fits-all approach that is clearly unhelpful because the resident has now heard two, from two trusted source Sources have heard two contradictory statements, and that reinforces the status quo bias and provides downward pressure on their willingness to do anything that changes their sense of place, to make that investment in not only the cost and the effort of reduction, but that change in their sense of home that the vegetation that they have become accustomed to is part of. I would appreciate the opportunity. We think this is critically important work. The fire service is here to be a partner. We understand we cannot suppress our way out of this. 
Fires are a natural and recurring part of the landscape. However, fire suppression, fuel mitigation, and the pricing of the residual risk are things that can be understood, and it would be very helpful as we move towards an aligned space where the various stakeholders are speaking with the same voice around the basic science in this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to um, open it up for Q&A, but I, first I'd like to introduce um, Assemblyman Freddie Rodriguez. He's the chair of the Emergency Management Committee. Uh, welcome, Freddie. Did you want to say something? Once again, uh, thank you for inviting me here. Very um, helpful discussions as chair of the Emergency Management Committee. Obviously, we're entrusted on making sure California is better prepared and safe. I always look at California as a disaster-prone state. Fires, floods, and that big earthquake that's coming, right? How do we can better prepare our counties, our cities throughout this state with valuable resources, planning, moving forward, and lessons learned, right? Every, it's a very unique time when we have, whether it's the fires, the floods, earthquakes, what are the lessons learned, what are we going to do better for the next time, right, and how do we better prepare ourselves. California always looks to be the leader in a lot of things, so I think at this point we need to be the leader in preparing our uh, communities throughout California, whether it's the fire, the flood, or the earthquake. But once again, I want to thank everybody for being here, and thanks to both chairs for having me join them as well. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions? Uh, someone on wood. <clears throat> First of all, thank you to both of you. Appreciate that. Um, uh, so I, I, my district is really fire prone, obviously. Um, the largest fire this year, I think, is, uh, is the Smith River Complex up in Del, uh, Del Norte um, and Trinity County area. Um, and it's about 95,000 acres. So that sounds like a big fire, but in the big picture, we've had a really, so far anyway, a relatively light season. Um, but there's a difference. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, when you're up there, it's federal responsibility area, uh, federal, federal Fire, fire agencies are just letting a lot of these these fires burn because there's not a lot of risk to structure. So, um, but when we get closer to the WUI, which uh, you chief are, are 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 talking about here, then 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 that's where for us a lot of the rubber rubber meets the road. So, um, I'm curious um, and appreciate the information there and and what you're doing. And and but I'm curious. You a lot of work has been done, obviously. Um, by your agency and, the, and for, on the benefit of the people that, that live in your community, yet it's not been reflected by, by insurance. So what do you think the cap modeling is going to do to change that? I mean, what do, if they're looking forward, they're looking forward based on what you, where you are now, or, or what is it that you, what do you think is going to be different? Because you've done a lot of work and that didn't, that didn't impact rates and didn't impact coverage. So what's going to be the difference from your perspective? So with the, the previous historical loss models, they only looked backwards. And so it was not possible to report work you had done, not planned, but had completed, because it was a lagging indicator based on fire loss on a much larger scale. As cap models come into use, as communities do work, such as is being done in Marin County and in this county, the, the cap risk modelers want to run the most accurate model they can. They're running those models, the, the combination of topography, weather, and fuels, based on a fuel model. And the most accurate fuel model will equal the most accurate results. So as communities do work, that modifies the fuel model. And if the fuel model is modified, the results will reflect the change in the conditions on the ground. And in so much as those results result in fire taking longer to enter a community, particularly with the emerging ability to value the firefighting response, our belief is that the, the models will then reflect, accurately reflect the conditions on the ground. And in that, I believe we all have a shared desire to see accurate models and accurate inputs to reflect the conditions on the ground. And in doing that, I believe, we will set conditions to encourage adoption and maintenance of wildfire risk reduction measures because there will now be a direct outcome in the form of, of the modeling and the rates that come from modeling that currently doesn't exist. Is, is there a critical, and the, and the final question, is there a critical, um, you talked about uh, how some mitigation leads to, you know, a, a, a lack of, or a, a redu reduction in uh, potential for loss. Um, 
you know, I look, I, there's an area I walk, I walk my dog every day and uh, there's three homes that live on it that are on a hillside. Two of them have done a fabulous job. They look a lot like what you pointed out and, and the work that's done in forests, uh, Mr., uh, Dr. Collins. Yet this third one hasn't done a blessed thing. And so for me, in my mind, after all the, what I've seen over the years, it just feels like that community is still at risk. Those three homes are at risk because one neighbor isn't on board with, with all of this. What do you, is there a, is there a critical mass or a model there that, that does reduce that risk? Um, because I don't know how you get everybody on board. There's still some people who believe that every twig and everything is completely sacred and shouldn't be cut or removed. So what, what is the critical mass and how do you get that message across to people? The critical mass within a, a block of homes is 30%. Is the minimum threshold rising to about 85%? And I agree with you, we'll never get 100% of the folks. There are folks who either feel strongly or are indifferent or don't have the means or, or any of a variety of reasons. And the law is, is certainly very um, deferential to a resident of their home around conditions on their private property and close location of the home. But from an actuarial, actuarial standpoint, when at least 30% of the homes in a, block, a significant block, and that typically is about 100, have done the work, that starts to bend down the curve of modeled wildfire risk. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, Chief, you talked about the retrofits for home hardening. So what would funding typically come to help some of these homeowners? Obviously, the cost is probably quite a bit, but is there incentives from either states, cities, counties that would help to retrofit these homes? Sure, at the state level, uh, Cal OES is undertaking a joint effort in four pilot communities now. That's a little more extensive. That includes things such as siding and windows. Uh, the, the absolute bare minimum is wood shake groups have to go. That's been reflected in state law for some time now. Uh, it has not been legal to put a non-treated shake roof on in quite some time. And then for vents, um, there are a number of local agencies that have incentives, Marin County, my community, Berkeley, others. But a vent retrofit in the form of one eighth inch or finer mesh is a very, very inexpensive proposition, both low cost of materials, low cost of labor, and, and outsized impacts. Because when taken in conjunction with creation of defensible space that's been the basis of state law since 1994, well, 1967 really from 4291, fire just does not have a pathway to enter the home at scale. Now, there will always be onesies and twosies. There will always be outliers. But the vast majority of circumstances that lead to structural ignition are mitigated with the replacement events and the creation of defensible space around the home, which is low cost, high impact, particularly when undertaken at scale. Thank you as well to the panelists. Um, quick observation, then a question. Chief, wanted to pick up on your point, and it seems like the status quo right now is all too often, even as homeowners or, or neighborhoods, if you will, are stepping up and doing the right thing around home hardening, vegetation management, they're still losing their coverage or certainly face that. Uh, risks. That's something I think we're all very concerned about. There's been legislation introduced on that. So just sticking a pin in that, I think that's going to be an ongoing issue um, because it seems completely counterintuitive to what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, following up on some of my colleagues um, and kind of from our vantage point, how can we be useful is in your views, has the state taken the necessary actions and made the proper investments to reduce risk from future wildfires? And what more needs to be done? Certainly the investment made in firefighting resources, firefighting aircraft, increased number of hand crews, increased event, that is very helpful. More firefighters are helpful. When we are on those shoulder fire events that are not a conflagration, they're not the early phases of a fast-moving wind-driven fire. As Dr. Collins showed during days one and two of the Creek Fire, no number of firefighters were going to stop that event. That fire was going to run until it hit rocks or the wind stopped, and there was nothing else to be done about it. So that investment is, is, is a good thing and is very helpful. The state has begun to put additional investment into the retrofitting of homes and increased its CCI investment in fuel breaks and other wildfire risk reduction measures. I would say a critical gap in the space, in the CCI fuel break and um, fuel treatments is there is no money for maintenance. 
included in those investments. And when we put in a fuel break, depending on the fuel type, if it's in grass, you get six months of value. The next year, there is no residual value for that. In brush, it's about three to five years. In timber, it's more like five to 15. But when we put in fuel treatments in a brush fuel model without any maintenance funds, it is a statement of fact that within the next five or so years, there will be no residual value for that treatment. And so including the maintenance funds, which is pennies on the dollar, an initial entry is always more expensive, including maintenance funds in the form of prescribed fire. And I would lastly, I would suggest the, the primary limiter on the use of prescribed fire in proximity to communities where it has the greatest benefit. I'm not speaking about the landscape level treatments and forest stuff because that, there are others who are far more experienced on that than I am. But as we seek to reduce the vulnerability of our communities, one of the most effective ways to do that beyond defensible space and home hardening is introducing fire as a maintenance tool in areas that we have made an initial entry, usually through grant funds. And the air quality management concerns and the limitations are the limiting factor on our ability to put more fire, beneficial fire on the ground. The number of days where it is safe to burn, and I'll say as a fire chief, I signed the burn plan. I have personal liability, and if that fire gets away, I am a former fire chief. So I have real liability about this thing getting away, and I have this tiny band of permissive conditions in the spring and the fall where it is safe to burn. Some of those days fall on areas where air quality will not give the approval for the, the PPM release, and so we are shut down. And I, I don't disagree that they have an important job, and I don't disagree that air quality is important, but currently prescribed fire, there's no consideration given for the offset and the reduction of future wildfires. And the, the emissions of a structural fire at scale dwarf anything we will see in well-managed prescribed fire. And every year we lose, particularly in our urban uh, counties and regions, we lose prescribed fire days because of air quality concerns. And those are days that then all that fuel just rolls over. And as I mentioned before, every vegetative item that grows and is not burned just carries over to a future year. So as Assemblymember Wood mentioned, this has been a relatively light year for fire. So it was last year. And, be and that's mostly because of the heavy rains. Everything's still very green. You can't get the brush to burn this year because it's too green. All of that brush and all that great growth this year is going to carry over to next year and the year after, and our ability to thoughtfully get fire on the ground is the best way to maintain the fuel breaks, splats, and other fuel treatments that the state is generously funding but is not funding the maintenance of. I frankly don't agree with any of that. I, um, I, I think the other, other thing to think about, actually, just to, to add on to, is that these, these treatments are not a one-off, they are a regime. We essentially need to commit to this regime of replacing what fire would have done. Uh, what fires, you know, if it were doing, resuming its natural role, we now take that on and we take it on in different forms, but that's, that's the thought. It's not as though we just, we treated that, now we walk away and go somewhere else. Uh, I just want to say I'm glad I came today. Not only are we taking off our shake roof this morning, but there was controlled burn just about, in my area, about, uh, I would say, five miles north of Woodside that you showed us um, in that exact five miles as, a sh as the crow flies, controlled burning last Friday. So to all the carriers in the audience, I'm hopeful that my rates will come down. I'm just saying. No, but in any event, I find that very interesting, the maintenance part of it and, and, and the trouble with air quality when you try to do it. But it did happen last week in my area, and um, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm going to rest easy tonight. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank both of you for being here. This information is especially helpful. Um, I actually happen to live uh, in an urban area that's part of the WUI, and so... Um, I see this, when I go in my backyard, this, these hills haven't burned, I don't know, probably 100 years. And um, I think our homeowners association just hired a herd of goats, but there aren't enough goats to you know, create a defensible space in my mind. So I appreciate you being here. I'm gonna turn this over to you now, Damon. Great, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panelists. We'll move to our next uh, panel. How does California become resilient to wildfires? 
So as our next panel, we will be examining the steps California has already taken to become more resilient to wildfires and the actions still required to reduce risk and better protect our residents. To help address increased wildfire risks, the state has taken step, several steps in recent years. In 2021, the state budget guaranteed nearly $1 billion in wildfire prevention funding for the 21-22 fiscal year and required at least $200 million annually in additional funding for the next six years. This funding commitment was nearly triple what was approved for wildfire prevention and resource management in 2020. More recently, in July 23, the governor announced $113 million in new funding uh, made possible by the $52 billion California Climate Committee Commitment Budget. These monies largely went to various wildfire grant programs. For example, the funding announced this past July will support 96 wildfire prevention projects across the state with more than eight in 10 grants directed towards vulnerable or underserved communities. So to kick off the panel, we have Mark Brown, the executive officer of the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority, a local agency we're very proud of. Uh, so welcome, Mark. Thank you, I very much appreciate the invitation. And yes, like uh, Assembly Member Connolly said, my name is Mark Brown. Prior to being the executive officer for the MWPA, I was deputy fire chief for Marin County Fire with 30 years of experience, 15 years on a CAL Fire incident management team as an operations section chief, which means I was assigned to some of the most devastating fires in the state's history. Uh, six years ago, I was the incident commander of the Nuns Fire for the first 24 hours. And back in 2020, uh, the glass fire burned through my neighborhood in Santa Rosa. And to your point, um, nine homes in my subdivision were destroyed because three homes became ignited. And it was, it was actually, there's a walk that I take through my neighborhood and I took pictures of the defensible space because some people had done great work and one person was responsible for five homes right there. And so um, part of my transition through my fire service career is 30 plus years of putting fires out and I decided it was time to stop suppressing fire for me personally it was time to start working on the prevention side of the shop and we need more people doing that so the MWP I want to recognize we are not doing anything that's really novel what's novel about the MWPA is our governance structure dedicated funding and the pace and scale at which we can do work that's what's novel about the MWPA so I do think we have a repl replicable model we did create a strategic plan with five goal areas. I'm gonna start in the middle because we have a house out approach, but this, these goals show that we take a systems approach and we have to apply all of the systems in order to be successful. So first part is defensible home evaluations and we target to, to um, evaluate one third of our homes within our jurisdictional area every year. We move into improve evacuation systems and also improve our evacuation routes. We're reducing wildland fuels wildfire fuels both within our communities along the wildland urban interface boundary and then working with our land managers with fuel reduction and forest health projects as well. It is so important that we educate the public. We won't get the public to come on board to do their work until we provide the proper education. Just coming onto someone's property and saying you need to do this because we're the fire department doesn't work. You need to show them the why. And then we also provide grants for our residents and a low um, senior low income uh, the tax exemptions. We're fortunate to have a 20 million plus dollar a year uh, budget, uh, thanks for the passage of Measure C, two weeks before COVID, so I'm really glad the timing worked out well there. Uh, 10 cents per square foot of building space is what the property tax is. 60% of our budget goes towards what we call core projects, so the vegetation um, uh, removal, evacuation route, improvements, public education, grants. And then um, defensible space, 20% of our budget, so 4, point, um, 4 million and change goes towards defensible space evaluations. Uh, measure C sunsets at 10 years, of course, we're gonna try to renew that, but after 10 years and we look backwards and we look at the successes of the MWPA, I believe our defensible space evaluation program will be seen as the single largest success. 
And then the last 20% is a pass through to our 17 member agencies because our law or our fire agencies know their communities so well. They know what their communities need and they will are able to use those monies in the same way that we use them for the core projects. Again, we are working on a house out approach. We feel that too many of the residents have their houses at their backs and they point at the wildland and say that's the problem. We are trying to get them to turn around and look at their house and say, if you can keep your house from igniting, then the home to home spread doesn't happen. So we're really trying to get residents to focus on their houses. Again, our defensible space valuation program has been a, a pretty big success. We have about 80,000 inspectable properties in, in Marin or within the JPA. We're averaging about 33,000 inspections per year. This year so far, we've conducted 27,000. 60% of the people who have received an inspection have taken some form of action. Doesn't mean they did everything we asked them to do, but they have taken some form. It's probably not possible for people to do everything that's on that list. So we help them prioritize what needs to get done, start with the riskiest items, the low hanging fruit, and move on from there a year by year process. We also have the ability to have the, the report exported to the Insurance Institute of Business Home Safety. If only if the resident wants that to happen, we don't share any data unless the resident gives us permission to share that data, then they can um, receive potentially a wildfire prepared home designation. We are also inspecting for all of the items within the Safer for Wildfire regulations, both positively and negatively. So if, if a resident, let's say, has done a, um, has class A roof, non-combustible siding, and non-combustible closures through fences, We'll actually know that within our system and we can tell the, that to the, the homeowner and they can go to their insurance company and say, hey, I have these items. Here's a report that says I have these items. I'm supposed to get a discount. So that's one of the things we're working on as well. Our resident grant program has been remarkably um, successful. Last year we expended $800,000 in um, homeowner grants for both for defensible space and home hardening. Defensible space is $1,000 per resident so it's no match. Five to up to 5,000 um, with the match required for home hardening except for key items. Gutter guards, vents, and the seals underneath your garage door refuel are just too important that we don't have to have a grant in order to receive those items. This year we've distributed 225 grants already. We've expended $458,000 of MWPA revenue, but what I think is important is that 3.2 million has been expended by the residents. For every dollar the MWPA is putting out, the residents are putting six dollars out. So we see that as a huge return on investment. The return on investment for the resident, for the um, taxes they're paying, they're able to get a grant. Their neighbors are getting a return on investment because they their, their neighbors have made their homes safer. And then the MWPA is getting a return on investment because we're investing in the community and they're stepping up. This doesn't include, the, that 3.2 million doesn't include people who didn't apply for a grant and were, were adjusting our data collection system so we can start capturing that data as well. Chipper days, after you receive a, an inspection and there's vegetation that we're suggesting that you remove, sometimes removal of that vegetation, taking care of it is one of the most expensive items. We can sign up for chipper days, truck pulls up, picks it up for you, hauls it away. Last year we uh, hauled away over 1,000 dump trucks worth of material. This year, we're about 60% ahead of what we, where we were last year. And in public education, a tremendous amount of effort going towards a public education, but that bottom left picture is my favorite form of public education, and that's in our inspectors meeting with our residents. That is the best way. We also have Ember Stomp, which is a wildfire festival. Uh, last year, we had 2,000 people attend. This year, we had 5,000 people attend. And the people, the vendors and contractors who come to that festival have said that the Marin is the most well-informed when it comes to wildfire safety that of any of the communities they've gone to, and we think that is an indication of the success of our public education. Evacuation route clearing, the picture says it all. I, I won't even say any more, but uh, we're doing a lot of evacuation route clearing throughout Marin. This is one thing that's novel. I don't know of anyone else who has done this, but we've also conducted an evacuation ingress egress risk assessment. We're evaluating every roadway within our joint powers authority, not just for wildfire threat, but also its ability to communicate cars up and down the road. Are there parking problems? Are there traffic control issues? We're also looking at our communications network. If we can't get the evacuation notifications out to people, how, how do they know to evacuate? We're also modeling how people behave during evacuations. So this way, 
we not only know if a road is risky, we know why that road is risky, and now when you know the why, you can actually do something to fix that and make evacuation much safer. Of course, we have to have prescribed herbivory or, you know, grazing. Shaded fuel breaks along the wildland urban interface boundary is one of the things that we're doing quite a bit of. 22 of our projects are shaded fuel breaks, but what they really are is increasing the defensible space along our wildland urban interface boundary from one to 300 feet. We're not expecting these shaded fuel breaks to stop the fire. We're expecting these shaded fuel breaks to decrease the fire intensity, decrease the rate of spread, and it increases the amount of time that our residents have to safe, to, to evacuate and they under a safer environment, and it provides access for our firefighters to actually go in there and suppress fire. It works for, for the small fires, that three acre fire that gets on top of a, a house faster than a fire engine does, but it also supports us during these mega fires as the embers are broadcast from the approaching fire and land in the shaded fuel break, they're less likely to ignite a new intense wildfire up against our wooey boundary. In the, the greater Ross Valley shaded fuel break, 16 or 38 miles, we've, that, that data up there is actually wrong. We're about 22, 23 miles completed. And then we have a 60 mile project in Novato that we've started and we're about five to seven miles in there. We are using science to model where we are putting these shaded fuel breaks, how wide they need to go, but also we know that we can't do it all at once. So we're using modeling to pick the, the riskiest areas and we're hitting the riskiest areas first. And then finally, the, 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 one of the types of projects we're doing are strategic in place local area treatments. This is a, an example of the San Rafael San Anselmo uh, splat. And it's in an area that has a lot of fire history. And you can see that it, fires will get onto the community very, very quickly there. And with the onshore flow pushing fires, we've had numerous fires that started to the left of this picture and transitioned through that area that we're planning to, to create the splat and has impacted homes immediately. So now we're working on a project that we will start next spring. We're not removing all the trees and the vegetation in there. What we're doing is we're thinning it. We're removing the dead and down. And so as the fire approaches that splat, again, its intensity goes down. Our residents have more time to evacuate under safer conditions and our firefighters have a chance to succeed. And with that, I can pass it on to the next speaker. Any questions at the end of this panel again? So we'll next hear from Mike Noonan, manager of training. Compliance and Assessment for Wildfire Defense Systems, and then from Mike Peterson, Deputy Commissioner for Climate and Sustainability at the California Department of Insurance. So Mr. Noonan, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members. Uh, appreciate being here. As you introduced me, I'm Mike Noonan, and I am here on behalf of Wildfire Defense Systems. Uh, I may refer to that as WDS. And, uh, presentation, so thanks again for inviting us. Uh, I spent, uh, I, I entered the fire service in 1979. I retired as a unit chief at Tuolumne Calaveras Unit, uh, Cal Fire. Um, actually worked over here in my career, uh, three different assignments, so I'm pretty familiar with your country, so it's nice to hear some of the work that's going on around here. It's an honor to be here. Um, throughout my uh, fire service career, I uh, picked up a service dog. Uh, this is River down here. She accompanies, accompanies me wherever I go, and she's doing pretty good today. She's got a little training going on, so thanks for having River as well. So what's WDS, or Wildfire Defense Systems? Uh, what we are is a qualified insurance resource. And I'm not going to bore you with trying to explain that, but I'm going to read you what your law uh, claims that we are. And we are personnel and equipment working for or contracted by an insurance company with a mission to mitigate risk to insured structures and operating in compliance with instruction and oversight of the incident command or incident management team of the authority having jurisdiction. So this service that we provide, it's key to know that this is available to all of our insured, all right? The, the rich don't come first and, and take precedence. If they have a policy written into the uh, insurance company that we uh, uh, contract with, we go out and provide services. So our mission is protecting insured properties from destro being destroyed or destruction from uh, wildfire. And uh, here in California, um, 
if there's a significant fire in California these days in 2023 and their structures threaten, wildfire defense systems is probably there. Okay, it's becoming more the norm. Uh, this is a picture of our uh, uh, National Coordination Center in Bozeman, Montana. Not only do we have services in California, but we're uh, in 21 other states, so we cover 22 states. In California itself, we have uh, a regional coordination center in Riverside, one in Visalia, California, and one in Sacramento. And we have a lot of assets that we deploy. Uh, the nation's, we are the nation's largest provider of wildfire response services for insurance companies. Uh, we measure coverage, or we're measured by coverage area and wildfire fighting resources and assets. Uh, if you compared us to all the other um, agencies or wildfire producers, uh, we're number three next to the federal government and the state of California. In 2023, uh, our service covered in excess of 2.5 million California single family homes. Uh, what we do in WDS is uh, we do wildfire monitoring. We've got a sophisticated uh, uh, system set up in that National Coordination Center that you saw a picture of slide before last. Uh, we have a lot of people staffing that. We're monitoring fires in the 22 states that we mentioned. Uh, California is our busiest uh, uh, state by far. Our, uh, we access coordination, so once we discover there's a fire, we do a smoke check on it. We feel that we have assets at risk, we deploy. We uh, go out and perform pre-fire front mitigation, and this is very different. This is a new concept. We're, we're, uh, we're not here doing structure protection, we're doing mitigation. This next uh, bullet point says we do structure protection, but what we really do is structure preparation. We're interrupting that chain. You've heard that chain of events that happens to that uh, lead from the vegetation within the wooey that lands into the structure and then goes structure to structure. We're there to interrupt that chain of events. Um, we also hang around and do po post fire front mitigation. So we make sure that there's not rekindles and uh, we make sure the fire is fully extinguished. We work hand in hand with uh, agencies that have jurisdiction. We've asked their permission to get on fire. We provide them information about our assets, including addresses within their incident and their hazard uh, area. Uh, we have a whole team that I mentioned uh, of folks in Bozeman. We have uh, a lot of engineers and, and folks that are doing really good work and coming up with new ways uh, and innovative ways. And some of the simple tactics that we do is we'll go out and we'll cover vents uh, in advance of the wild, wildfire that may be threatening a structure. The reason for that is to keep embers from entering into the structure. We'll close up any other openings that might be um, an avenue to access the structure and start the structure on fire. Uh, the second slide or the middle slide there is we remove combustible debris. This is an example of this, uh, especially you know, where I come from in Tuolumne County, pine, pine litter is a significant problem. Uh, this is something that will uh, mitigate in advance of the fire. We have some fancy devices on our leaf blowers, so we get up in rain gutters and remove uh, vegetation from that. Seems pretty simple, very effective, like 99% effective. Creating safe zones is something else we do in front of the pre-fire front intervention. We deploy sprinkler systems that come to collapsible uh, tank that will deploy and then we apply uh, retardant at times and uh, as we're speaking right now we're testing new product uh, up in Bozeman and our engineers are doing some uh, testing on a new product that we're looking to uh, put into service uh, fire season 2024. So our innovation is real, some of it's simple, some of it's high tech, but the outcome is fantastic and uh, the uh, principles are very simple. Uh, again, uh, after uh, part of the post-fire front intervention that we do, I mentioned it, hot spot mitigation, we hang around and, and we'll make sure the fire is fully extinguished. If we do have flare-ups in the areas on one of our properties, we'll uh, deal with those and then we rehab the property. And uh, one of the neatest things that we do is we're providing real-time photographs and information to our insurance uh, uh, contractors and they're in contact with the homeowner and the homeowner is getting real life data and information about their home. And you can't believe the letters of appreciation that we get. You know, when we were all firefighters and I was growing up as an instant commander on an instant command team and an operations section chief on a CAL FIRE team, I, I was telling 
one of my partners in the back here, uh, it used to bring tears to my eyes when we'd get ready to leave a fire and, and there was uh, thank you firefighter signs that were up there. It really meant a lot. You know, you spend several weeks, sometimes months back in the day on uh, these incidents and to get that recognition, that's not what we do it for, but that's the kind of recognition and the appreciation that our firefighters within WDS is getting. And you, I wish I would have had some time to read some of these letters for you. This is new and innovative, and it's very much appreciated by the homeowners in California. So what we have at our assets, we have over 500 uh, wildfire service experts and professionals. I've talked about some of them, they, uh, from fire watch commanders to engineers uh, to dispatchers to people that track the resources. We have 180 qualified insurance resources at our disposal. Um, interesting thing is we're one of the only private industries that's affiliated with the International Association of Firefighters, Local uh, 96. So our firefighters are union members and uh, we, uh, since our inception, we've monitored over 100,000 fires. Uh, we've dispatched resources and pro provided structure protection services for insurers on over 1,200 wildfires since 2008. We've served over 33,000 individual properties since 2017. You see a correlation here. And uh, we have done this at a success rate where we've intervened on properties at a 99.6 survival rate. Our broad footprint uh, lends us to the ability to, uh, which has happened, uh, been on 26 separate fires in five different states all in the same day. Um, wildfire monitoring and dispatching, I've mentioned that already. WDS National Coordination Center is open 365 days a year. We're staffed with fire behavior analysts, fire officers, programmers, database specialists, GIS specialists, professional services division, and data science and engineer teams. We monitor for wildfire incidents, wildfire weather, fire activity, fuels conditions, local resources, and activities. I wish I could all put you in a car and take you to our National Coordination Center. It's pretty impressive. Uh, you have some things that rival that here in California, obviously with OES and CAL FIRE's uh, two different uh, regions. Continuous intel exchange with field operations happens all the time. We're feeding information back into the National, National Coordination Center. It flows back out to our uh, resources on the, on the ground. And uh, obviously we are very proud of the state of the art information and intelligence center that we have. So uh, in conclusion, uh, you know, I, I was talked out of retirement because this thing's pretty special. And uh, I take a lot of pride in what we're doing. The folks that through our training and the innovations that we're coming up with is state of the art, second to none. And again, we're the largest uh, such uh, company uh, in the United States. And I see this as, uh, another tool in your toolbox for this very important topic that you're talking about. You know, since 1979, I've seen a complete uh, change in the landscape of wildland fires in California. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to go next to Mr. Peterson. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me. Um, I am Mike Peterson, and I serve as Deputy Commissioner for Climate and Sustainability at the California Department of Insurance under the leadership of Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara. Commissioner Lara is the regulator of the insurance markets in the state of California, which is the fourth largest insurance market in the world. Today, I was asked by the committees to respond to the very timely question of how can California become more resilient to wildfires? This question is central to how the department has approached the challenges posed by climate intensified wildfire risks for insurance availability in our state. I'm also pleased to provide these follow-up remarks from when I testified before the Assembly Select Committee on Wildfire Prevention at its informational hearing held earlier this summer regarding this similar topic. The overarching approach of Commissioner Lara has always been to prioritize reducing risks to California communities. The Department of Insurance has focused a multi-year effort on engaging with consumers and stakeholders as it assesses how new tools can improve risk management, make residential and commercial insurance more accessible and reliable for Californians, and maintain competition and ensure stability in the state's insurance marketplace. The department has been very clear that benefits to and protection of consumers are of the utmost important importance as we strive to meet the interlocking goals of Commissioner Lara, namely making insurance more available to Californians, 
creating a resilient insurance market, and protecting communities from climate change. Today, the focus of my testimony will be Commissioner Lara's Safer from Wildfires framework, announced in 2021, which has been a collaboration among the state's wildfire preparedness agencies to communicate home hardening and community mitigation actions to Californians, and the subsequent continued strides made as a result of this framework. Wildfire risk reduction is the result of the combined work of entire communities, neighborhoods, and individuals to take the actions necessary to make us all safer and is critical for insurance availability, affordability, and reliability. We've heard many examples already today on the combined efforts that are ongoing in our state. Insurance has historically been about pricing risk and being a source of resilience, funding that occurs after a devastating wildfire. What we are doing at the Department of Insurance is taking specific actions so that insurance incentivizes risk reduction before a disaster occurs, saving lives, reducing losses, and bringing down costs. The Safer from Wildfires program was launched in 2021 by Commissioner Lara, convening the major wildfire preparedness agencies, and I'll I'll list them briefly. The Governor's Office of Emergency Services, what we call Cal OES, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, the California Public Utilities Commission, and CAL FIRE. And I appreciate the effort by every agency on this overall initiative. Our goal was to establish a list of home hardening and community mitigation actions that were based in fire science. In one year's time, we met with the research experts from the Institute for Business and Home Safety, the University of California, consumer groups, insurance trade associations, fire chiefs, and wildfire safety experts, among others. The Institute for Building and Home Safety is a research organization that tests home hardening strategies and determines those that are most effective to reduce losses to structures. The University of California has researchers across the state that are studying wildfire risk to communities and developing strategies that bring down that risk. In early 2022, the partner agencies publicly announced the Safer from Wildfires framework, a consensus of core home hardening actions and community mitigation designations, actions that are clear and consistent, effective and achievable. The actions recognize that we need structure hardening We need to work outward from the structure to the surrounding property and also together within our communities. Starting from the structure itself, there are six structure level actions in Saver from Wildfires. A class A fire rated roof, five foot ember resistant zone around the structure, a non-combustible six inches at the bottom of structure walls, ember and fire resistant vents, double pane windows or added shutters, and enclosed eaves. Some of those actions like replacing vents can be relatively economical and can be accomplished rather quickly in a day or a weekend. Other actions will take longer. The key here is for consumers to get started. Many local fire chiefs and local fire districts are providing important coordination and encouragement for homeowners and business owners. Moving outward from the structure into the area immediately surrounding, there are three actions in Safer from Wildfires. First, cleared vegetation and debris from under decks. Second, sheds that are moved, uh, sheds or outbuildings that are moved at least 30 feet away and third, trimming of trees and removing of brush in compliance with state and local defensible space laws. And then finally, moving from the individual parcel level to risk mitigation for the entire community, there are two community level designations that are recognized and safer from wildfires. First, neighborhoods that form a Firewise USA committee, a committee, community, um, of which there are over 700 in our state. Um, And then secondly, cities, counties, and local districts can become certified as a fire risk reduction community which is a designation established in state law and implemented by the California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. What I verbally shared just now is essentially the list of home hardening and community mitigation actions that are included in Safer from Wildfires, which is also additionally outlined in the committee's background paper. For those communities facing wildfire risk, this framework can be used to focus effort on the consensus actions of the five partner agencies. Our next step was to make Safer from Wildfires most impactful to insurance consumers and the public. In 2022, Commissioner Lara, under his authority as California's insurance commissioner, finalized the first ever regulations by any U.S. state to require homeowners and commercial insurance companies to provide incentives to policyholders who take these home, business, and community hardening actions. This process included public workshops and incorporated the Saver from Wildfires framework. In addition to wildfire mitigation, this regulation is now requiring insurance companies to provide consumers with the property's risk score and a right to appeal that score. The regulations were finalized in October 2022, and insurance companies had to file new rate filings by April 2023 in order to comply with these rules. The rules state that insurance companies must incentivize risk reduction for each and every action on this list. 
That means that the more work you do, the more you can save. This will be an ongoing incentive to harden homes and businesses and invest further in community risk reduction across our state. This regulation is one step in what has been a four-year effort to encourage home hardening. In 2018, only 7% of the state's policyholders had access to home hardening incentives. By 2021, that number had grown to 40% of policyholders. The new wildfire mitigation regulation being implemented by the department will ensure that 100% of policyholders have access to these incentives. One key here is that home and homes, businesses, and community hardening actions that are contained in our regulations are consistent across insurance companies. This will help give consumers the confidence that their investments in risk reduction will be rewarded. Every insurance company writing residential or commercial coverage is required to provide these incentives. The important thing is to encourage homeowners and businesses to get started with what is achievable today and then work from there. We have an outreach and education team that is working with communities and stakeholders all across the state to assist consumers with questions on this issue specifically. I also want to emphasize the importance of alignment across agencies, state and local, to make California more resilient to wildfires. Insurance pricing will be one incentive, but there will be state grants and local grants that can help neighborhoods and homeowners achieve the actions in Saver from wildfires. Some of these actions are not new. But what is new is that Commissioner Lara's new wildfire mitigation regulations are making risk reduction actions more clear and requiring incentives that increase adoption of home hardening actions that save lives and property. In closing, Safer from Wildfires framework is an essential piece of making California more resilient to wildfires and supports Commissioner Lara's recently announced sustainable insurance strategy. I do want to briefly note that in the background here that there are um, specific numbers on total claims. Um, both for fire losses over four years from 2018 to 2021, and also those that incorporate smoke and wildfire. Um, these numbers uh, are uh, really important and notable, and um, I do want to continue to work with the committee to resolve and clarify some small differences uh, in the numbers that were reported versus the numbers that um, are in our uh, reports that are on our website. In particular, the claims and, and losses are a bit higher than what is in the background, but are similar in interpretation and scope. I look forward to working with the committee further on that effort. In closing, I'm happy to answer your questions about wildfire safety and mitigation. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. We will bring it back to members for questions. Hello, um, Mark, I believe when you were talking earlier regarding uh, the clearing of the brush around uh, properties, is that something that should be, depending I guess where you live, that's something that should be done yearly or every other year? That's a great question. So obviously we want, we want our homeowners to be maintaining their yards every year, if, and actually times like this, probably more than that. Um, but when it comes to the fuel types of our shaded fuel breaks, it all depends on the fuel. Grass, we're gonna be going back every year and treating the grass. Brush, we anticipate three to five years. Timber, seven plus years. The good news is the, the amount of effort that it takes for the first pass is up here. And then the amount of effort for the subsequent is down here. And so what we look at for the MWPA is that for the first several years, new and emerging project funding has been up here. Maintenance is down here. We've already started in year four, starting to see new projects come down and maintenance come up. I, I anticipate by year seven, we're gonna be maintenance is here and new projects are down here. The good news again, the maintenance is a lot cheaper. And I just have one more question for Mike from uh, Wildland Defense System. So I'm looking at your handout, which you're presenting and your, uh, looks like, is it your, dispatch center, your monitoring center. Now, how do you guys work with like Cal Fire OES? Because I know they kind of all do similar things and I know things can get hectic on that fire line, right? When things are kind of getting out of hand, so to speak. But how does the coordination with all the different entities working together, you're kind of almost doing the same thing, but not really. So I guess it depends on the incident commander where all the information is going through to make sure we got the resources going all the right places. How does that work, that coordination? Uh, great question, Assembly Member Rodriguez. Um, the bottom line is when we arrive on incident, we meet with the incident command team or incident management team and we ask permission to uh, incorporate into their incident so they can keep track of the resources and we don't become a liability. And it's very important for us to be transparent and disclose where all the properties are, 
that would be in the influence of that wildland uh, fire setting. And the work that we do is very different, and, and it's very important for us to announce that our work is very different. Uh, the agencies or local government are very concerned with perimeter control, obviously. That's not our mission. Our mission is to get out in advance of the, of the fire at a safe distance and take mitigation members. You keep talking about hardening, hardening the structures and that kind of stuff. That's essentially what we're doing. We're going out at last minute hardening structures that uh, uh, our clients of the insurance companies that we contract with and those simple measures have proven to be highly successful. But what it does do is it enhances the agencies or the local government's ability to focus on their job and not have to take care of some of those tactics and strategies that might work on these particular structures that belong to our clients. Um, I hope that answers your question, sir, but our, our mission is very different. We, we coordinate with the agency or the local government that has jurisdiction on the fire and, and coordinate our activities. Thank you, sir. Right, great. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Um, appreciate, uh, really appreciate all the information. Uh, um, I've heard, we've heard a couple times now, maintenance is really important. Uh, you can't just, it's, these are not one and done issues. I know in uh, Ukiah we have a, had a big fire break that was, had been done for years and then neglected. So the costs go back 10, 12, 15 years later to, to do that's really, really, really high. So that's something that's a takeaway for us as to how do we find a way to incorporate in these grant programs a maintenance component of that so that we can main, so we can keep these these going. Um, question for Mr. Brown, you talked about a lot of things. Are you utilizing control burn as, as part of your strategy as well? Yes, it, it, it falls within our member agencies. The fire agencies will actually be conducting the, <coughs> the, the prescribed fire, but um, we either do pile burning, which is prescribed fire, but we also have broadcast burns. We just had uh, three days of burning in Novato that Merritt County Fire was coordinating. State Parks, uh, China Camp is gonna be doing some burning soon. And then um, Marin Water is gonna be burning a 30 acre plot up on top of Mount Tam later this week. Where we come in support, we can provide some of the funding for the project work, but we can also help with the environmental compliance. The whole idea, you know, you, Chief Winnaker put it very well. It's you have to look for the right windows of time for these prescribed fires to occur. So what we want to do is be able to get all the environmental compliance completed up front, get the plan created, and have all of our um, um, air quality permits approved. And then when that right weather window comes into play, then we can go burn. And that's what is happening this week. Well, I appreciate because I appreciate that, and I, I uh, <clears throat> I'll just note, and I'll get on, I'll get on a little bit of a soapbox here for a minute because. Um, I know the air quality management districts all operate in such somewhat of an autonomous way. Um, that's really challenging for, for people um, in different counties. There's also, um, I know that in some counties, um, there's no cost for a burn permit, and in others, it's hundreds of dollars, which is, also, which is an impediment. I've heard multiple times over the years of, of agencies and groups all staged to do a controlled burn and be shut down by the air quality. And my frustration is, and I, I don't know how I don't know how to get around this because I think if you want to talk about autonomous, we'll talk about CARB uh, for a second um, here. Because at some point, you know, I would rather see a little bit of smoke than live with days and weeks of, of smoke from fires that are in communities. Yet there seems to be a lack of coordination or understanding by the, the by CARB. On, on, on some of this, I understand that. So I would welcome from any of you ideas about what we could potentially do there because I understand and I appreciate and respect what CARB is trying to do, but at the end of the day, if we can't do some of these control burns and have a little bit of smoke and mitigate risk, we're, we're still looking at these big smoke events. And you know, look, I was up in a couple weeks ago up in uh, Del Norte County, uh, and that, that smoke that you saw in the Bay Area um, for the days was coming from up there. And, um, and so that was a federal responsibility area, different animal. But, but the lack of consistency with the air quality management districts, the ability to coordinate with CARB is really frustrating. So if you have some ideas about how, what might be guidelines that could be helpful, um, I'm all ears because we're trying to figure this one out. A couple, couple thoughts. Um, First of all, you're right. Smoke is a pay me now or pay me later proposition, and pay me later is a lot more expensive than pay me now. 
if you look at the type of smoke that's coming from prescribed fire and compare that to the type of smoke from high intensity fire, there's no comparison not only in the volume of fire, but what is in, inside that smoke, much more dangerous smoke. There's some research going on that is talking about the avoided wildfire emissions so that yes, we might re release some carbon, we might uh, take some trees that are sequestering carbon away but we're improving the health of that forest. A healthy forest sequesters more carbon. And then we are also preventing that large carbon emitting event from happening. And then there could be regulations that we could put in place or encourage the air quality management districts to exempt a prescription or prescribed fires from parts per million type activities, smoke management plans, just make it a little bit easier for us to go through the regulatory process, streamline it. Sure. Sure, thank you. Um, so this question is for Mike Peterson. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail on how the Safer from Wildfire framework works and um, what kind of discounts can consumers anticipate? Absolutely, thank you very much. So the, the, the way that this works is the department's regulations require these 11 factors in every rate filing that uses wildfire risk as a, as a rating factor. And so if you, um, no matter who your insurance is, if they're rating you based on your wildfire risk, these factors will be integrated into it and bring down that risk um, in, in terms of what you pay. At this point in time, we received the rate filings in April 2023. Um, the FAIR plans rate filing has been approved, so those who have FAIR plan policies and are in the highest risk areas will see the beginnings of those discounts as they're implemented. Um, and then the remainder of the rate filings are under review at the department and we'll have updates in the upcoming uh, months. But in general, if you think about it, if this is related to your wildfire risk, then the riskier you are in terms of hazard or the area that you're in that has higher hazard, um, this discount will apply and will potentially provide a bigger discount in higher risk areas than it may in other areas as well. But, um, but that's the goal is to provide a clear and consistent statewide set of factors. Different insurance companies will um, have different ways of implementing that, those factors, but um, every uh, consumer, once these rate filings are approved, We'll, we'll see that um, in what's offered in terms of their premium. Thank you. One more follow-up. And what does a wildfire risk score mean, and, and how is that factored in? Thank you. So for the past several years, many insurance companies, if not all of them, have used fire risk scores that are a combination of different um, broad factors, like access roads, uh, fuel load, slope of a, of, a, of a certain property. And that gives you a score that's been used in premiums um, going back probably the last 10 years. Um, because of the recent regulations, now mitigation has to be part of that scoring. And these Saber from Wildfires factors become part of that. So these are now things that, that um, a homeowner can control to a certain extent of vents and roofs and five feet of non-combustible space. Um, and so it does sort of merge with some of the ways that insurance companies have looked at pricing over the past 10 years. But what it does is it gives uh, consumers that incentive that if you do some of these, take some of these actions and you build through that over time, you will be rewarded in the insurance pricing. Okay, thank you. Great, and just, uh, uh, oh, my apologies, go, go ahead, yeah. Mark Calderon's questions. So we hear a lot about this idea of pricing based on prospective risk. And I'm just curious, how does that come into play with trying to mitigate damages that could happen around your home or home hardening or safe space or whatever it may be? Are those considered one and the same or is that something different? I think it comes down to, to two different approaches. So what, we've, what has been used thus far has been a look at historical losses over the last 20 to 25 years. And so in those losses, um, there's no specific uh, factors for certain risk reduction actions. They, they're sort of integrated. If they've, if they've had an impact historically, then they're part of that history. But anything recent, and you think of what we've heard of from today from Dr. Collins in terms of prescribed fire, um, or Chief Winokur in terms of you know, an expanded focus on home hardening, those are more recent safety measures that wouldn't be fully reflected in that historical record. Um, 
what catastrophe models allow for is um, a look at the risk assessment for what it would be today and in the immediate near future. Um, and that's, you know, in, in some senses, or that is likely much more accurate to what the risk is at the moment, as opposed to what it may have been as you average over the last 25 years. Is it that the perspective takes into account what an individual might do to mitigate as well as what climate may impact in the future? Is it a combination of those two? And right now we're only looking at what an individual might do to mitigate. That's the only perspective part we're, we've gotten so far. So on the, the perspective part, I think it's really, I think there's, there's sort of a distinction here. It's what is the most recent types of mitigation actions that, that have occurred and that information that can be integrated into a model. So it's not prescriptively assuming that, you know, I am going to do, um, put in a new roof in five years or something like that. It's in the recent, the very recent past, what mitigations have taken place that we can demonstrate and that could go into a model. Um, the perspective nature of it is that when it comes to climate change and looking at how wildfires are likely to burn, there are, um, there's sort of scientific data that can inform what we expect from next year, which is the year that insurance companies are looking at in terms of their policies, is what's going to happen next year. And so that's the prospective nature of it, is using the science that we know about how fires are burning, what we know about mitigation, what we know about forest management, into what can be projected into the next year when, when the insurance decisions are being made. Questions? Okay, just a, a couple, um, starting uh, with Mark Brown. Um, in, in your view, is CAL FIRE uh, getting grant money out the door in a timely manner? With the Fire Prevention Grant Program, yes. I think it, f for the resources that they have internally, yes. The challenge, though, is for those of us who have many projects and having to apply for each individual project at times can be very cumbersome. We would really enjoy to see a block grant type program. We've been working with one TAM, our land management agencies, and um, they've created a fantastic forest health strategy that has a chapter of all their projects. We're combining that project's list with our project list, and we're calling that our regional priority plan. And if, if we feel that if you present a regional priority plan, that you can lean to, point to, then a, a, a block grant program can be very successful, and that'll be able to increase the pace and scale that people are doing work. Yeah, and as you know, I happen to agree with that, and, and we're pushing some legislation on that, and we'll continue to do so. Um, related to that, um, from a community perspective, uh, could this grant process be improved or streamlined in any way? Is it really the best way to do that through a block grant model? For the community re resiliency? Yeah. I think so. We've applied for uh, some grants along that line, but the demographics of Marin are not putting us on top of the list for its support in that. But I do think it's a lot easier to, b to funnel money into an organization like ours to support the residents rather than the residents having to go out all on their own. Okay, great. Have efforts to expand access to home hardening programs been successful in your view? And particularly, are the grants being successfully distributed to low and moderate income households? Yes and yes. Well, we are seeing a lot of work being done. We are definitely always trying to improve the program. Right now, we are treating all of the hazards as equal risk. Our next rend uh, rendition of the grant program it will be prioritizing the risk, so we'll be at having people remove the hazards that are the riskiest items or improving the items on their home that are the, the riskiest items first. So that is one tweak that we have there. Accessibility, we need that that is one of the, the weaknesses of our current program right now. It is um, a reimbursement program, and so those without the financial resources for a reimbursement program, it isn't great. But we have some beta tests that are going on now where we are coming in onto the property with the property owner's permission and getting the work done so they don't have to um, leverage their own finances and then get reimbursed by us. Great. And then to uh, Mr. Peterson, you mentioned the sustainable insurance strategy, which was recently unveiled. Um, if you could just kind of quickly summarize what you see as the implementation 
uh, strategy for that plan. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, so as Commissioner Laura announced, our timeline is sort of immediate and urgent, and so we are looking to implement it by December of 2024. Um, as part of that plan, there's, there's three main goals. How do we expand insurance availability in at-risk communities? How do we stabilize rates and coverages? And then how do we protect communities better from climate change? And so as we move forward, there's, um, uh, we've had two workshops on catastrophe modeling so far, two public workshops on catastrophe modeling where we've garnered testimony from uh, many stakeholders. Um, our most recent was about a week and a half ago. And so we're um, reviewing that testimony and coming up with next steps moving forward. But as the commissioner articulated, um, we are looking at um, a number of new sort of regulatory ideas and, um, and also uh, you know, what types of expertise uh, we can best bring to bear to get to communities safer. And so it sounds like the public will have an opportunity to, to weigh in to that process. Consistent with how Safer from Wildfires was, was done, there were public workshops. You know, we have, we've had catastrophe modeling workshops so far and we'll continue to have those types of uh, public events and Great. workshops. Great, and then final question, you started to allude to this. In terms of uh, catastrophic modeling, how will that account for climate change? So current, it, it, first of all, it, I can't speak for all catastrophe models in one broad brush, but generally speaking, catastrophe models have been used in the insurance sector for um, several decades when it comes to underwriting properties. And so they do take into account things um, like landscape level management, uh, meteorology, meteorological information um, in order to produce the catastrophe re uh, modeling results that are used in underwriting. Um, when it comes to, to climate change, you know, given that we're now into California's fifth climate assessment, we are learning more and more scientifically about the impacts of climate change on wildfires, flooding, heat waves. And so that scientific information uh, goes into hazard maps, it goes into risk assessments, and modelers are able to integrate that into what um, they produce in terms of what, the, what you'd expect for catastrophe, the probability of catastrophes in the next year. I think what is really um, important is that we are learning more and more about the risk mitigation actions and their impact. And so over the last three years, the state's invested, I think, $2.7 billion into wildfire resilience. Um, as that money comes to fruition, as the prescribed fire um, increase regimes come to um, fruition, you're gonna have scientists who are looking at those mitigation actions, better understanding them, and that information um, will lead to better models that reflect uh, safety measures, I think, in, into the future. Yeah, you, you literally just anticipated my final point. And I, I think that is just point blank, you know, catastrophic modeling should better account for wildfire prevention projects, the mitigation uh, features we're talking about today, so appreciate that. So with that, I'll turn it back. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. This has been very, very helpful. We appreciate you participating today. Thank you for having us. And so uh, we're gonna start our next panel, which is gonna focus on the question of, can consideration of risk and resiliency lead to property insurance market recovery? On this panel, we have Karen Collins, the Vice President of Property and Environmental at the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. Robert Harrell, Executive Director of the Consumer Federation of California. Saren Taylor, Vice President at Personal Insurance Federation of California. And Amy Bach, Executive Director of United Policyholders. Welcome. And I think we'll start with Karen whenever you're ready. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Karen Collins. I'm Vice President of Property and Environmental Policy Issues for the American Property Casualties Insurance Association. For those not familiar, we are a national trade uh, supporting auto, home, and business insurers. Um, and we are um, an established organization with a legacy of over 150 years. And our members do represent all sizes, structures, and regions here in California, across the U.S., and also um, globally as well. Um, in my role, I serve as a policy expert on property and natural catastrophe issues um, with a specific emphasis on mitigation resilience, and that really focuses on developing state, federal, and international public policy recommendations for our membership itself. So I'd like to, t I appreciate the opportunity to share insights on today's 
uh, insurance market here in California. I do want to cover as a starting point the, an overview of the market challenges that we're facing and then dig into um, a discussion on how greater resilience to the wildfire issues um, will, resilience to wildfire is going to help improve the insurance affordability and availability here in California. So starting at a broader high level, the U.S. property insurance market is in fact facing the hardest market cycle in over a generation, and it's impacting catastrophe exposed markets really across the U.S. There's a number of factors that are impacting this. Um, I've listed a handful of those. Really the top factors that are driving the most recent cost pressure include significant inflation, elevated natural disaster activity, and also land use policies, which are exacerbating the effects of climate change. And I'll, I'll touch on some of these briefly. Um, to start, just for example, between 2020 and 2022, the U.S. has experienced over $287 billion in insured natural disaster losses, making it the costliest three-year period ever for U.S. insurers. For loss events that have occurred since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic specifically, the costs and timeframes needed to rebuild and also replace the contents inside of homes have also been further strained by the rapid onset of inflation, which just last year reached a 41-year high of 8%. Looking specifically at construction costs for single-family residential homes, uh, the construction materials in this time frame have shot up 35%. And labor separately has climbed 30% as of June of this year. So this has resulted in much higher loss costs well beyond the typical demand surge effects that we might normally see after natural disasters. So the impact on the homeowner's market insurance line is that we've seen a combined ratio of 100 for five out of the most recent six years. And anything over 100 typically means that insurers have spent more than they have collected in premiums. And we're seeing the same pressure in commercial lines as well with a combined ratio above 100 for the last eight, year, eight years in a row. So looking at California, among these losses, California has experienced seven of the 10 costliest insured wildfire loss events in the world just between 2017 and 2022, according to Aon data. We are also seeing the state has experienced its largest fires in recorded history by acres burned. And you can see some of those stats here in this chart. A recent analysis from Milliman, a well-respected actuarial firm, has noted that the losses from 2017 and 2018 in California specifically were so significant that they wiped out over 20 years of underwriting profits for homeowners insurers. And we've been trying to climb back from that since. Of concern, though, the threat of catastrophic wildfire losses is continuing to climb. This is in part due to the growth in population and communities in our wildfire-prone regions, as well as the impacts from climate change, which is resulting in hotter and drier conditions, as, as many spoke about today, which is enabling fires to ignite more easily, spread more rapidly, and burn more intensely, which is essentially making them more difficult to control and suppress. I'll highlight briefly the Dixie and Caldor fires from 2021. They're not notable in the sense of they're not the costliest insured loss events. But when you talk about fire behaviors changing, for the first time ever, conditions enabled wildfires, these wildfires, to burn clear across the Sierra Nevada mountains from one side to the other. The first through the Dixie fire only to be repeated a month later by the Caldor fire. This is unprecedented in recent modern history. Now, there's some other issues that are inflicting additional pressure in states, which are amplifying the effects of this current hard market. For example, in the aftermath of the severe wildfire losses here in California, we've seen a flurry of legislation and regulatory changes that have been enacted. Now, these have been well-intentioned, intended to help protect consumers by providing more robust coverage under their insurance policies. I'm a California resident. I appreciate them. But these policies have also introduced higher costs and volatility that makes modeling and in turn pricing wildfire risk more challenging. And insurers have also faced some significant constraints in managing the growing risk that we do have in our state, such as the lengthy time frames to secure approval to increase rates, and also limited access to certain tools that are critical to managing catastrophic risk in general, wildfire included. So the result is that some insurers, as well as reinsurers, may be more hesitant to deploy capital due to the uncertainty of expected future losses the prospective losses, and the ability to collect adequate premiums to cover those prospective losses. Finally, 
Insurers are also facing higher costs for capital, which is critical to provide coverage in any catastrophe-prone region. For example, reinsurance, which for those not familiar is like insurance but for insurance companies, that has surged in cost. In the U.S., we have incurred over 70% of global insured losses in each of the last three years, and we are on track to repeat that again so far this year. So the large volume of natural disasters has resulted in much higher reinsurance prices for less coverage for companies, while other forms of capital, such as catastrophe bonds, are also similarly experiencing higher prices. So as a result, insurers are diligently working to manage the costs as well as the capital that they have to ensure that they can fulfill all their obligations for all the risks they do take on. These are the collective pressures that are contributing to difficult decisions from individual companies that may need to adjust what coverage they are able to provide to consumers in the marketplace today. So where is the intersection of resilience to addressing this current market challenge? I think it's important to first recognize that there are two distinct challenges that we do face in California. The challenges of insurance availability and separately an affordability challenge. Now addressing the availability challenge largely stems from whether insurers have the ability to navigate and adjust to market pressures. And that just largely has not been the case unfortunately and why there are a lot of discussions underway for the reforms that have been talked about earlier to ensure companies have the necessary tools to manage the rapidly evolving risk and costs associated. Now, setting those issues aside for today's discussion, to address the rising costs and the risks that our communities face, which in turn are impacting the affordability of insurance, we need to focus on the underlying issues. We need to bend the loss curve down. So, mitigation. This is the key strategy to achieve that, which is where California's Safer from Wildfires framework does come into play. In wildfire regions across the U.S., insurers have long advocated for reducing the excess fuel loads that we have accumulated in our, our WUI areas and re-examining where and how we build communities in these wildfire-prone areas. This includes the local land use policies, the adoption and enforcement of not just building codes, but for us in wildfire, defensible space standards, and strengthening the existing homes and businesses so that they're more resilient. When these actions are done at scale, it should reduce results in a meaningful decrease in losses, and that's what will ultimately translate to more affordable and available coverage for consumers. So as insurers, we strongly support the Safer from Wildfires framework because it strongly aligns with the science through the Insurance Institute for Building Business and Home Safety. They have an evidence-based framework known as Wildfire Prepared Home, and these programs are very strongly aligned, and they do provide critical steps that consumers can take to protect their homes. Under the Safer from Wildfire frameworks, Framework, yes, insurers are required to provide insurance discounts for their actions. Though what we as insurers want to stress is that the science shows that these actions, they need to be done together. They need to be taken together to meaningfully reduce risk. So a onesie, twosie here or there, picking one and not the rest, is not going to fully address that. It needs to be taken together to reduce that risk. And that's what we've been working very closely with fire officials in California to educate on that. We're also working at the federal level to steer more resources to support these efforts at the state level. For example, our president and CEO, David Sampson, has been serving on a federal wildland fire commission focused on ways to mitigate and manage wildfire losses. They actually just released their final report on September 27th, just two weeks ago, and it includes up to 148 consensus recommendations to help our nation mitigate and manage the risk of wildfire. Several of the key themes in the report encourage greater collaboration, shifting from reactive to proactive, increasing, of course, investments in resilience, and employing urgent and new approaches. This is a national crisis that we are trying to tackle. And the consensus of the commission is that it, even though comprised of a diverse group of experts representing numerous federal agencies, state, local, and tribal governments in the private sector, all strongly support the focus and need for greater mitigation. Now, what you can see here is that there's a number of stakeholders impacted by this. And it's not just the insurance companies, but it is many stakeholders. Yourselves, state and local officials overseeing the land use policies and codes and public safety. We are also working closely with those in the construction industry, those that set the codes and standards and those that build, and also the financial services industry. We must work in alignment, as was mentioned earlier, to help bend the risk curve down. Um, the alignment 
really requires a more holistic approach to funding and incentives, and I do believe that we can achieve this. There's a lot of talk about grants. Grants are important. There's also opportunity for low interest loans, waiving or reducing fees, or providing tax credits for resilience. In addition to the insurance incentives that have gotten a lot of attention, we're working towards implementing those. But we do need this to be a holistic strategy that all reinforces this in an aligned way. So with that, I know that we have several on this panel. I do welcome the, uh, the discussion, and I'm very happy to answer as many questions you folks do have, but I wanted to start with that as kind of just level setting. Good afternoon, Chairs Calderon and Connolly and members. I'm Robert Harrell, Executive Director of the Consumer Federation of California, or CFC. I also spent six years previously as a California Deputy Insurance Commissioner. Thanks for the invitation to discuss the consideration of risk and resiliency and its impact on our property insurance market. I'll discuss that and also make a few broader comments in my, in my few minutes here. And I should note that especially competing with the visuals from the first two panels, I smartly chose not to have visuals for my few comments. For insurance companies, risk is part of their business. Let us not forget, however, that these are for-profit enterprises. What does that mean? It means maximizing premiums is good for an insurance company, and so is minimizing or reducing claims payments. While that is clearly an oversimplification of many of the moving parts, it is relevant to any discussion about risk and resiliency. Here's why. Despite rhetoric coming from the insurance industry, California remains a very profitable market for insurers. I'll use data on industry loss ratios to make this point. Uh, and I had tip to my colleague, Doug Heller, with the Consumer Federation of America on this. Loss ratio data, again, this is data that comes from the Department of Insurance itself. The lower the loss ratio, the more profitable the business for the insurance industry. According to the Department of Insurance's own data, these are the following loss ratios for the homeowner's line of insurance for California over the past four years, rounded to the nearest percent. In California in 2019, the loss ratio was 33%. In 2020, 38%. In 2021, 46%. And in 2022, 55%. By comparison, here are the nationwide loss ratios for these same four years. In 2019, 58%. 2020, 67%. 2021, 69%, 2022, 71%. Even in the least profitable of those four years nationally, California was still more profitable. What this data means is that on average, California insurers only had to pay out 43 cents on every dollar of premium they took in, while nationally insurers paid out 66 cents of every dollar between 2019 and 2022. So the California homeowners insurance market has been significantly more profitable than the nation as a whole from 2019 to 2022. I believe that contrasts a little bit with the data you just saw from APCIA, which is why I'm using CDI's own data. The 2017 and 2018 wildfires were devastating disasters to Santa Rosa and other nearby communities with significant loss of life and property. There were also, these were also, for insurance companies, two less profitable years. Though it is important to note that insurers got back about $12 billion from PG&E and Edison to cover many of those fire losses since the actions of those utilities and inactions in many cases caused a number of those fires directly. So when insurers talk about risk and argue for, among other things, forward-looking catastrophic models to be built into insurance premiums, which usually means they're gonna go up, by the way, the view of CFC is that California should develop a fully transparent and publicly developed tool, leveraging our world-class public university systems and others that would help insurers better assess climate-related catastrophic risk. I wanna emphasize that point. We are not opposed, per se, to forward-looking models, but we do think that there are some really important public policy questions that must be answered as you endeavor or as the department endeavors to go down that road. Such a tool, such a public tool would not be perfect, but neither are private proprietary models made for by, let's face it, for-profit companies. A more transparent model would help build confidence in the very communities left behind 
as some insurers have limited or refused to write new policies in California. This forces homeowners to the fair plan, as I know all of you know all too well, or the completely unregulated surplus lines market. So historically, a surplus line insurer, my example was always uh, like a Lloyd's of London. You're an actor or an actress or a singer. You're trying to insure a body part. This is not something you walk into your farmer's office and, and get coverage for. But uh, they have now jumped more into the market, and we've also seen a lot of growth in the fair plan, without a doubt. That trend started when I was still over at the department and has clearly exacerbated since then. Um, but they're unregulated, completely unregulated. This brings me to resiliency. CFC has asserted for years that a much stronger connection is necessary between homeowners who take steps to harden their homes and enhance resiliency and the rates and availability those homeowners face in the marketplace. You've heard plenty of discussion about that already in the first two panels. It's an important topic. The department has taken a first step, as Deputy Commissioner Peterson noted, in that direction, but we believe if homeowners and communities do the right thing, then they should be able to access insurance. And currently that connection is unfortunately far weaker than it really ought to be. Um, to Peterson mentioned as well um, some of the, the uh, proposals that came in uh, from April, and he said the fair plan had been approved. We would love to see uh, in this area more rapid action uh, by the department to approve some of these mitigation discount plans. We think that that would really help get us to, as you heard in, in the first panel, the fire chief and others talking about that sort of critical mass of 30% and beyond, especially in those suburban areas. We think that's very important. For example, incoming Senate leader McGuire and Assembly members Connolly and Aguiar Curry, you're all authors of a bill, SB 672, that would ensure that homeowners insurance is available to those who have followed the current California best practices for wildfire building, hardening, and property level mitigation. That's just common sense. It's not a panacea, but home hardening works, and the data, as you've heard, is getting stronger and stronger all the time. Uh, that bill's currently located at the Assembly Insurance Committee. I'd like to make two other brief points as I wrap up my comments this afternoon, and thank you again. First, a significant public policy dilemma facing public policymakers and regulators beyond just insurance is the use of algorithms, models, and technology in such a way that it is difficult for regulators and lawmakers to keep pace. This is not brand new, but we're seeing new manifestations of it in this and other areas. This is a challenge vexing policymakers throughout the state, nation, even the world. And appropriate public policy responses must err on the side of transparency so that policymakers, regulators at the department, and the public can see and understand and pick apart what is going on and why. It is only through that process that you wind up with an optimal public policy solution, or as le at least as close to optimal as is possible, that maximally protects consumers while still allowing, as Prop 103 does, for substantial profits to still be made by private insurance companies via rate filing submitted to the department for prior approval. Remember that the regulator does not have unlimited resources. They cannot match, for example, the market rate for numerous professions. One that really jumps to mind for me, from my experience, is actuaries. Um, it, it has been very difficult for the department historically to, re to, to retain, let alone get in the door, top-notch actuaries because the pay scale is just dramatically different from what they can make from the private insurance companies. All of these things together contribute to the deep need for transparency. Uh, finally, I am a little bit concerned that the department might be putting the cart before the horse or falling victim to assuming a particular set of solutions that many stakeholders have yet to see. Uh, I heard recently from Insurance Commissioner Lada a lot of what insurers have wanted and asked for for years. Higher rates via forward-looking cap models, which I've addressed in my comments, and allowing for completely unregulated reinsurance costs to also drive up rates. And you just heard from APCIA that reinsurance is one of their issues. Again, that's another industry that is completely unregulated. So when you allow those costs to bleed over, we view that as a danger of a double charging. Um, when you take an unregulated industry that can basically make their price whatever they want, 
and then you allow those costs to bleed over onto consumers, it's usually consumers that wind up holding the bag. And we haven't seen that push and pull where by paying more, they're retained in the market or they're not cut off in other ways. What I heard less of from the commissioner a couple weeks ago was the strengthening of resources to help homeowners and communities increase their resilience. Though in fairness, it is mentioned as part of the plan. We just haven't seen the details yet. I'm also concerned, to be honest, that many stakeholders have been largely shut out of the process until now. My participation has been when there's been public fora, public fora that is open to the public. Um, but there are other conversations that are happening that we think all stakeholders must be in. Even just looking at the APCIA's slide from a few minutes ago, uh, that was all industry partners linking arms together. Consumer organizations, people representing consumers, are stakeholders in this area, and we should be part of the mix in a meaningful way. The details are forthcoming on the commissioner's plan. I look forward to seeing them, and we're happy to play a constructive role in trying to help consumers and help California move forward. With that, I'll conclude my comments, and I'm happy to take questions at the end of the panel. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Saren Taylor, on behalf of the Personal Insurance Federation of California, um, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's discussion. Um, before I start, I've been weighing in my mind whether to briefly sort of comment on Mr. Harrell's unique opinion that uh, insurers are somehow leading very profitable lives in California beyond the most obvious point that it makes no sense these companies would be hitting the pause button on this supposedly lucrative California business. And um, I hate to get into a sort of he said, she said, or uh, you know, Twainsian uh, lies, damn lies, and statistics, but I thought it would be notable um, since he's talking about the Department of Insurance, this is in fact the Department of Insurance, California Sustainable Insurance Strategy. It's on their website. In this document from the Department of Insurance, it says, over the past 10 years, homeowners insurance companies have done far worse in California than nationally. Direct underwriting profit countrywide, 3.6%. California, minus 13.1%. Direct profit on insurance transactions, countrywide, 4.2%. California, minus 6.1%. Direct return on net worth, countrywide, 7%. California, 0.8%. And that's from the National Association of Insurance Commissioners Profitability Report, released January 2023. So just set a little record straight there, and, and I think I'd also just note that AM Best, which is a 100-year-old company that issues financial strength um, measurements of insurance companies' ability to pay claims. They're designated as a nationally recognized statistical rating organization by the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission and the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. And just three weeks ago, uh, AM Best revised its outlook for the U.S. homeowner segment from stable to negative specifically because of the deteriorating homeowners performance related to all the factors that Ms. Collins noted earlier, elevated natural disasters, rising inflation, hard reinsurance market. So I just think this notion that insurers are doing fine and, and you know, it's sort of a disservice to everyone who's working hard to find solutions. Um, with that, I will, you know, sort of get on my comments, you know, I think Ms. Collins thoroughly described and a fantastic job um, talking about financial, regulatory, and climate-related challenges insurers are currently facing. Uh, I'll try not to be repetitive and instead focus on this core question of can consideration of risk and resiliency lead to property insurance market recovery? And the short answer, I think, is yes, when paired with fair rates and reasonable regulatory processes that provide timely results, California can restore insurance availability and reliability. The new normal of climate change and massive increase in catastrophic wildfires over the past six years has it's really clearly pushed California's insurance market out of balance and in a way that the existing 35-year-old regulatory system 
just never envisioned and it wasn't prepared for. I think, however, with the governor and the insurance commissioner's recent announcement of the plans to implement this you know, California sustainable insurance strategy, we are, we are very optimistic that together uh, we can restore that balance. And the new strategy you know, clearly envisions that mitigation programs <clears throat> such as the IBHS Wildfire Prepared Home uh, program that Ms. Collins referenced, the Safer from Wildfire framework that Mr. Peterson discussed. Um, these will be critical to help reduce risk and loss from wildfire and increase insurance availability. And in fact, the commissioner stated that as insurers focus on moving consumers out of the fair plan and onto traditional insurance, first priority will be given to homes and businesses following the new Safer from Wildfires regulations. So, you know, we understand people want guarantees that if they follow one of these um, mitigation frameworks, they will get pricing discounts and coverage from a traditional insurer as opposed to the fair plan, which is itself a guarantee of coverage for all Californians. And mitigation is extremely important and it's meaningful. And since there's no standard in the world that guarantees a home will not burn down in a catastrophic wildfire, mitigation must be paired with fair and adequate rates as a starting point for increased availability and mitigation discounts. And based on public rate filings, we know that many carriers are currently 20 to 30 percent, for even 40 percent rate inadequate today. And that's also listed in the commissioner's document here. Um, and I guess the question is, is it reasonable to expect uh, insurers to further discount rates that are 20 to 40 percent underpriced today. Is that something one would expect of your local bookstore, um, your local barber, your grocer, a family restaurant? Probably not because nobody would be able to stay in business. And the same is true of insurers, right? Under the current prior approval rate system in California, wherein all rate filings must be approved by the commissioner and are subject to private party interveners, there's tremendous uncertainty about when or even if an insurer will receive approval of their rates. It can take years to finalize a contested filing. If hyperinflation increases the cost to rebuild a house by 30%, as Ms. Collins talked about just happened, too bad. Insurers just need to eat that losses until something changes. You know, um, there's no guarantees of rate adequacy under the existing rules, which you know, unfortunately means it's not possible for an insurer to provide a guarantee of coverage. Underwriting mandates, which force insurers to provide coverage regardless of the risk, regardless of the fairness of the rate, it's a direct path to insurer insolvency and further market instability or even possibility of market collapse. I mean, that's what we're talking about. You know, however, uh, not all doom and gloom. I mean, we believe the pathway being urged by the governor and developed by the insurance commissioner is intended to address these complex issues. The goal is to provide consumers with much greater insurance availability, appropriate discounts, increased transparency, while also stabilizing the insurance market with new risk assessment tools and improved processes. You know, we talked about cap models, you know, new, new catastrophe models will recognize home and community mitigation and hardening requirements to appropriately price rates and discount benefits. That's not available in the current rate making process today. You know, California, like other catastrophe prone states, is going through a difficult period, sudden change and adjustment. And it's important to provide thoughtful leadership on these complex problems so California communities can get the insurance market stability they need to protect themselves from disasters. And we appreciate uh, your time and this committee's time investigating these important issues and really great questions and presentations today. So thank you. Oh, yes. Good afternoon. Um, always fun to be the last speaker, but I think we're all pretty engaged. I can tell you're all listening carefully. It affects your constituents, affects you personally. Um, so thank you for uh, your time, for convening the hearing. I'm Amy Bach. Uh, I run a national nonprofit organization called United Policyholders. Uh, we uh, have rolled up our sleeves 
we rolled up our sleeves, I would say, uh, well, right after the Oakland fire when there was a little bit of unavailability problem where insurers non-renewed some of the folks there in the Oakland Hills, we thought, well, that's weird. I mean, things burned. Why would they pull out after things have burned? But we came to understand how the red ink would get a CEO's attention and they would take action, even if it wasn't fully, to our minds, logical. Um, at that time, we were able to help consumers get the ins their insurance renewed by sending them, uh, in introducing them to inter independent agents and introducing them to a broader range of, of professionals. Obviously, fast forward today, um, we have a very different scenario. Our organization has been around since 91. We don't take funding from insurance companies, but we consider ourselves problem solvers. So we, um, we work in coordination with the Department of Insurance, with uh, the realtors, with our fellow consumer advocates, with the firefighting community scientists, um, to try to really get our minds around um, what's happening today, which is sort of a manifestation of this changes everything. Um, so we uh, do a lot of work in California primarily. I mean, that's, this is our home base. Our Roadmap to Preparedness program developed out of the wildfire recovery work that we do where people would come up short on their insurance and we would say, okay, let's get the folks who burn to be ambassadors in the community to say to people, you know, you really ought to pay more attention to your insurance, make sure you've got enough, right? Um, but when this problem that we're here dealing with started manifesting in 2016, uh, we had to kind of pivot a little bit and stop focusing on reminding people how important it is to be insured to value um, and start to really um, help people who, who are in crisis. And I make no mistake, uh, there are some communities in the state that are really suffering right now. They're suffering from crippling premiums. We're, we, the stories we are all hearing are mind-blowing. So I know, you know, Sarah threw out some numbers, but we know what's going on in the marketplace in real time. Condos, you know, premiums, HOAs going from 50,000 to 500,000. UP has an open survey going where we've been taking people's temperatures on what is your premium today compared to what was it, and it's breathtaking. Some people are in the 12,000, uh, 8,000, and we all know what's going on, that's why we're here. That is um, me on a ride along with um, the firefighting agency in Moraga back in 2016. Right after the tree mortality crisis hit, the governor created his task force. It sprung an insurance subgroup. We all started meeting up in Sacramento. Uh, Cal Fire and, um, and, and insurers and, um, and I learned at that time that there were a lot of fire departments in these rural areas that when their residents would get a non-renewal notice, they'd call the fire department or they'd run into the fire chief in the supermarket and say, could you, could you help me convince the insurer not to drop me? And that was working. The fire agencies would go out, they'd do the inspection, write the reports, give a letter, the person would use it to their insurer, would say, okay, all right, we'll reconsider, you're back on. So we thought, there's a gem of an idea. Let's see what we can do with that, right? This is a complex crisis here, right? You know, we all know that. You heard, uh, you heard Karen talk about inflation and the hard market and all these externalities that are affecting our market um, completely unrelated to Prop 103 or any of the arguments about prior approval. This is, there's a, a national phenomenon affecting the PNC sector and the reinsurance sector, right? So what are we seeing? You all know, that's why we're here. These risk scores, which, are, which have had a very dramatic um, negative effect on homeowners. It just, you know, just kind of like a credit score, right? It can really, really hurt you financially. Um, drone imagery, insurers are scaring, basically they're getting scared out of doing what they do, right? By, by this magnified risk, oh my God, look at the propane tank, look at the tree over the house, all those things. So this is all what's bringing us to where we are today, right? Um, yes, um, we are all frustrated. The mitigation discounts that the commissioner worked hard um, and we all worked hard to put into place, uh, they, the insurers filed their plans in the spring and we were hoping by now we would be seeing the discounts. So far we've only seen one approve the FAIR plan and it's good. It can be, it can be up to 15% um, and, and we've already done two programs, uh, my organization, one of them in partnership with Butte County, educating residents on how you get that 15% FAIR plan discount. Why are the other ones so slow? They were less than indicated. The insurers did not really come in 
with a full, a full plan that honestly would give the appropriate discount. So I think the department is wrangling, trying to figure that out um, so as not to disappoint because it is so critical that we get these discounts because it's gonna, you know, when you talk about the two, when Assemblymember Wood talked about two out of the three have done their thing and the one is sitting there and we know we need community-wide, well, okay, so if the, we need the one to have to be penalized by paying full rate while his or her neighbors are getting a discount, right? That's the kind of signal that we need. Those discounts have to get in place to inspire people. Okay, I'm on a tight budget, but I'm gonna spend some money here to fix what honestly doesn't seem broke, but the experts are telling me I need to do these things, I'll do them, right? That's what we need. So evolving priorities, I talked about this. Um, what's the bottom line for consumers? We know in brush-heavy regions and areas impacted by past wildfires, premiums have doubled and tripled. We are seeing more people going bare. We, we saw it in a lot of these smaller wildfires that we've been responding to, more and more people have no insurance. Um, we, we know how, how important the agent community is now, but they're of course also in free fall and hurting. A lot of agents are really, really struggling to put their people anywhere but the fair plan. You heard Robert mention the non-admitted, the surplus lines companies that picked up a, a bigger share and they were also providing these DIC pair to, that you can pair with a fair plan policy so that you get your liability coverage and your water and your wind. Um, but even that market is a little, a little, um, I don't know, janky, can you use that word, right now. Um, so, but we don't know how, what percentage of consumers have gone with these non-admitted companies. We don't know what percentage of consumers have had their lender, their mortgage company forced place. We should have a national survey and, and the federal insurance office was ready to do it two years ago. But then the state said, no, well, we'll you know, we're gonna do it. So now um, we're still trying to figure out where things are, all right? Um, my organization is in the trenches all the time doing webinars and updating people, telling them what the rules are. You know, if you get non-renewed, um, you need every day of the 75 days to shop, right? Um, uh, people are shocked. What do you mean the gov government can't force an insurance company to offer me a policy even if I do everything? Um, that's a political hot potato for y'all, right? And that bill um, that Senator McGuire introduced, which we are very supportive of, we feel like we gotta go there. Because when you go to other states that pass sort of light mitigation mandates and insurers should give you a discount, they will tell you honestly today, we should have we should have ordered a specific, we should have either ordered a 15% discount, which was where we wanted to start, but the but the insurer said don't don't force some artificial, you know, not warranted by science number. But I think forcing a discount is critical because insurers are they are they are gonna act on data and where are we? It's gonna be a while before we get the level of mitigation penetration that we need. But if we are so anxious now to look forward, you can project that for darn sure, with the BRIC grants, with the state grants that are coming down and all the programs now that are in place, there's gonna be a lot more mitigated homes. So, so, um, so we, do, we do have some progress here. Um, I'm gonna skip through all this. Um, you heard the concern that the people who are going with the non-admitted insurers don't have the protection of SEGA, of the insolvency fund, and that's a serious concern. Because I, we also, we just did a, I just did a webinar last week for Hurricane Ian people. And the people who have, or whose claims are going through FIGA, the, their version of SEGA, they're actually getting their claims paid, but the people that are with these really funky companies that are sort of private equity funded, you know, they brought them in to take people out of their, of their citizens, which is their fair plan, they're not processing claims so well. So it is important that we have these safety nets and that people are not out there um, without, a, without a safety net. Um, so we, we teach people how to do their homework. This is more bad news. A lot of insurers have stopped offering installment payments. They were making people pay their premiums in full up front. That's something the legislature maybe could, could do some work on. Um, we all agree. Mitigation is, is a good thing. That's the one area everybody is on the same page. But it is easier said than done, right? So um, we are surveying to you know, keep things going, but my organization now, since, since 
uh, about three years, we've had a monthly meeting. We have a, we call it the RAP group, Wildfire Risk Reduction Asset Protection Working Group. We've got counties officials. We've got CAL FIRE, IBHS. We've got professors. We've got all the citizen groups with FireWise and FireSafe and COPE. Everybody's talking. Oh, you, you know, what's a, what do you, how do you convince people who are reluctant? How do you move the needle here, right? Because this is the low hanging fruit. If you don't want to force private insurers to take customers they don't want, and there's an argument that we maybe should, then you got to do everything you can to substantively reduce the risk. Not just to get people eligible to keep insurance, but to be able to save homes. So we've made a lot of progress. I think we helped bring about the IBHS standard, the safe from wildfires, which are largely the same. We all now agree these are the things you need to do that move the needle. Now we're working hard to make it financially viable for people to do it. This is just one of the screenshots. And we've got um, some of the exemplary programs um, that we that we showcase. You know, Marin is leading, Mark's agency is leading the pack. We've been exposing other county communities to what they're doing, right? The matching grants. My organization got a grant from OES. We have a we have a RAP resource center. So you can click on your county and you can find out who's offering grants, who's offering events to help you. Very, very concrete. You heard Chief Winnegar talk about how things will grow back and how you know maintenance is important and how um, and that remains a challenge is but now we have a designation, certified wildfire mitigation specialist. It's a it's a thing, you can get that job now and we're gonna have a lot more of those folks going around um, and working. And this is, this is an example in Marin, they've got, they, they had some of the people in their department get that specialty, now they go out and they've done 5,000 um, and, and at that time uh, evaluations completed. And this is, here's Napa, they just got a $37 million grant, they're doing defensible space matching. There's great energy going on here, look at Novato. Now, uh, uh, admitted, they have, you know, community members who have the means to, to kick in for a matching grant. Not every community does. But this is the innovation that's going on and is going to be moving the needle. Um, we need those rewards. We need the discounts um, for all those reasons, the structure less likely to burn, um, improving people's risk scores, uh, and, and getting things back on track. IBHS has a great program, little slow take up, because it's tricky to do everything on the list. So although their program has been going for a year, they've only certified 68 homes in California. So we, we, we definitely love that the Safer from Wildfires is a little more flexible, and we're hoping that that's going to get us where we need to go. So in, in wrapping up, lots of progress. You've heard all this innovation on, on uh, shaded fuel breaks and everything else. Um, challenges remain, right? Um, insurers are still kind of on the fence with the discounts. They're still kind of wanting to, eh, we want to see more data, but again, we don't have the time for that. We know people are going to be mitigating more because they're desperate. They're desperate to keep their insurance. So um, we want to see a little more flexibility with the five feet of clear space because that's such a hard thing for so many people to swallow. Um, and a lot of fire experts say two feet is enough, but I respect the opinions of those who say it has to be a hard five. Um, we do need to model for homeowners that you can still have an attractive house even if you do all these things. That's a, that's sort of a, a mindset thing. Um, and you know, what is the one of the biggest challenges is the enormous power. I'm wrapping up that reinsurers have over our market. You can see that the fact that we don't really have an alternative, that our fair plan is dependent on there being admitted insurers writing business in this state, has us in a bind. That is one of the reasons why I've tried to listen so carefully to what insurers are saying they need in order to come back. And that's why we, we, we support the department in innovating and saying, okay, if cat models might not be the instruments of Satan since every other state is letting us use them, make sure the department has the resources to, to continue rigorously enforcing the prior approval laws, looking at the cap model assumptions and not just taking them at face value because we do know that the, most of the cap modelers are for-profit companies selling their wares to insurers and we do know that insurers are going to guess high to protect themselves and it's our job to protect the consumers from that. So in, in closing, um, the legislature has done some very important things. You've got lots more work to do. 
Potential solutions, I've just got four and I'm done. Enhanced resources for the DOI, so they really have enough hands on deck to review those rate filings. A uh, low interest state loan guarantee for the fair plan and CEA that would allow them, instead of buying their full complement of reinsurance, which is costing them an insane amount of money, that maybe they, they can only, they can buy maybe two thirds of their reinsurance and know that that other third is gonna be is gonna be a loan guarantee from the state or the feds. I think that is a critical tool we have to develop because you can see we don't have a lot of leverage here. We don't have a plan B. It's all our whole system of property ownership and, and real estate buying and selling is dependent on the private insurers. We do need a public cap model um, and I do think that just like the municipalities were allowed to get together when insurers abandoned, abandoned them and, and they were allowed to do self-insurance pooling, we're gonna have to ex explore the feasibility of letting maybe condo associations f form their own self-insurance pools because we really just can't keep going this way. Um, it's just, you know, the, the commissioner has been granting rate increases at a rapid pace and you can see where things are and you still have insurers saying they're not getting enough rates. So, so we, we have to be creative here. And thank you so much for your time uh, and for this hearing and I appreciate the opportunity to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm gonna open it up for questions right now. Go ahead, Sam Borman. So you mentioned public cap model just at the very end. And I, first of all, I wanna thank everybody for being here. And you, Mr. Harold talked about transparency. So what's come to mind, and you talk about resources, the Department of Insurance, all of those things. Yeah. I, you know, I, what's been rolling around in my head for a while is perhaps, and it's been suggested, uh, we have some independent source that people pay for, people insurance companies pay for, and we're all gonna be bound by that independent science as to what the modeling should be. And, and if you want to comment, comment, go ahead. It's really not a question. It's just something that's been rolling around in my head, and, and then we're not fighting about it anymore. Right. I, all I was going to say is like Cal Poly, Cooperative Extension, uh, Stanford, a lot of academicians and fire scientists have been on this, on the modeling thing. And so it's really a matter of having a, having a model that is not commercially derived to be a benchmark. Right, and, and insurance companies could do their own too and say, you know, sure. well, I want to compare my science with your science, but I, I, that one seems like it's easy to solve for me, but yeah. maybe you all don't like it. I, I don't know, but I'm just, yeah. just trying to get to the bottom line here. Yeah. Right. We just, I even mentioned it in my comments. I, I think the, the, you know, tapping into, as Amy just mentioned, the, the public entities that are either already doing the work here but are very interested in doing the work. There's, there's really no reason not to. Um, and, you know, I haven't explored this in great detail, but there's probably a way for some of the private modelers to participate. Having said that, they've just got, you know, right now there's a different motivation. I get it. If you're a for-profit company, you're trying to sell your product to the insurance company. And uh, more often than not, uh, that pro sometimes for the scores, they sell the product, and then it kind of gives them plausible deniability. Well, we don't make any decisions about whether you get renewed or not renewed or whatever. We're just providing that information to the insurer and what they do with it is their business. And I think that's frustrating for consumers because it feels like, hang on, everybody's telling me do these things, right? And as Amy pointed out, we're all, I would never put words in the mouths of my insurance industry friends, but I do think you heard consistently mitigating, doing these things, these are good things. If we're all in agreement on that, then why is the consumer getting this discordant message? That's, that it's, it's troubling. Uh, and as a member Conley, you mentioned that as well. Just one follow-up comment. Uh, uh, so I appreciate what Amy does because the insurance business is a very sophisticated business. I, I've been a lawyer for 100 years and I still find it sophisticated. So I applaud what you're doing to at least get the public on board. I, I just want to make a comment and that is I do think people have religion right about now because it is, it is from here to the hithers that people are concerned. And if you folks are losing, bleeding money to the extent you're bleeding money, go, well, let's, let's get beyond that because we're all frightened. And while inflation might be a problem, if people go out of business, it's gonna be a whole lot worse. So I'm hopeful that there can be that connection. It, that's more of a comment than a question, but I think we're on the precipice. I think you have enough people's attention 
that you're going to see more and more hoed hardening. I didn't want to spend the money, but I'm going to spend the money now because my two other neighbors have a far reduced premium than I have or whatever it may be. We're not quite there, but I think we're, we're on our way for what that's worth. Hey, um, Madam Chair, uh, Assembly Member, yeah, just to add, actually, um, we, we've never opposed a public model, and in fact, I can say PIF, uh, we supported, Assembly Member Friedman had a bill that included a public model. I was part of that work group myself, and uh, this idea of having public models that can be a benchmark, and you can use private models as well, and they, why they say, why are they different? Let's, let's talk about what assumptions are different. That's, that's always been fine. I mean, you know, that concept's been fine for us, so. Really good panel, thank you. Uh, so one question, and I think this goes back to kind of the fear out there, is that we, we embark on some of these reforms. It results in rates going up. Um, how can we ensure that insurance providers will not leave the state if there is another catastrophic uh, wildfire event? And for example, the, the experience of Florida comes to mind. So mainly to the insurance folks, but anyone who wants to respond. When it comes to providing coverage for catastrophic risk, it's about managing your capital. And that's why there's been so much attention on, on what is the cost of capital today and can we continue to provide that. Florida has its own unique set of challenges that they've fortunately enacted a number of reforms. Different states have different shades of different issues. Their, their issues were more of, of extensive abuses of the legal system and, and roofing schemes that really started to bleed out insurance companies absent a landfalling hurricane over several years. And those practices became so proliferated that companies and the reinsurers that provide a lot of that capital finally had to say that this is just not a sustainable model unless you enact reforms. And, and last year, you saw a number of companies that became insolvent because of many of these costs, even without a landfalling hurricane prior to Hurricane Ian at the end of the year. So they've taken steps to reform those. You see similar challenges in some other states. Louisiana is another example that's been in the news quite a bit, and they've had some of the similar practices that have kind of proliferated in some of the neighboring states, Louisiana being one of them. In, in California, the challenge for insurers really is the regulatory flexibility to manage what is increasingly volatile loss patterns. If you have losses that are stable over the last 10 or 20 years, you can use historical losses to price what you think is going to be future. But we just don't have that same stability. There's too many new pieces of volatility, whether it's climate, whether it's the land use policies, whether it's inflation. All these different pieces are resulting in much, much higher future expected losses. And so when you're going to see increasingly volatile conditions, we know we have evolving climate impacts that are going to result in more fuel and more challenges. If you just don't have the tools available to manage not just the ability to predict that risk, as well as the ability to reflect the cost of capital which is needed to pay for that level of catastrophic exposure, that's where you can't provide coverage for catastrophes. And that's where you're seeing companies having to pull back because they can't just provide coverage for everything else but wildfire. Our laws, our standard fire policy laws do not allow that. And that's why you see companies that have to pull back and they end up in the fair plan and then they come back and say, well, we have enough capital to do non-catastrophic and so we'll offer that unless we can raise more capital. And so right now you're seeing those decisions from companies individually looking at kind of what is their capital position? Do they have enough for what the future risk of losses is going to be? And if they don't, that's where you're seeing even impacts where financial ratings are being impacted. As mentioned, AMBEST, other financial rating institutions may be evolving and looking at these and saying, you, you need to strengthen your financial position or that can have a downgrade, which then even further deteriorates their ability to raise capital through the different entities. So all of these are interconnected, but it's the flexibility that we need in California more than anything else. That is what's distinctly different from Florida or Louisiana and many other states is that companies are just so, their hands are so tied in the ability to timely adjust and raise if they can't get these other pieces. And so that is what we're trying to work very closely with the department and, and many of you as well in recent discussions to address. And Amy, we'll get, sure. yeah, I want to hear from you. Maybe to tee it up more just kind of, real 
per, you know, on a human level is, so as we pursue some of these reforms, rates are gonna go up by and large. And we're really looking at what is the value proposition to consumers in the insurance market. If it's simply, hey, you're gonna pay higher rates, perhaps significantly, and the payoff is insurance companies aren't gonna leave the state, that seems unsatisfying, particularly if there's no guarantee they're not. So really what I'm trying to get at is what is the value add to consumers in terms of if, as we go down this pathway, how can we as representatives say this is how your lives are gonna be improved, you're gonna have better access, you're gonna have more guarantees to available adequate insurance. Um, if you do the right things, you're not gonna lose your insurance in PS, um, uh, you're uh, potentially gonna get discounted rates. So just kind of the tie into that. Go ahead, Amy. Um, I, listen, I don't envy any elected official in this environment here because, I mean, it's easy for me to say to a group, as I did probably six years ago, the days of paying under $1,000 a year for your homeowner's insurance in California are over. As I'm comfortable saying that, okay, maybe they would double, 2,000. People would be thrilled, to, you know, in a lot of these areas. So, so I would say, um, you know, certainly as part of the commissioner's announcement, it, it sounded like, and I really am not privy to the details, but that there's an agreement that insurers will um, will start taking people out of the fair plan and a certain percentage, you know, 85% of their market share in that. I mean, I, I if that that would be great. I think we do need some guarantees. Um, I think, you know, starting to like watching what's the trends. I do think we have to be working on a little bit of a plan B. That's why. You know, just so that the insurers don't have so much unfettered control over people's financial health in the state. Um, and also because we don't, I don't know, we don't think know where the sweet spot is of really what is the right premium, right? It, it, it can't, it feels like it can't, going from 1,000 to 10,000 doesn't seem fair or right. So, you know, it's, it is in the math here, right? Um, and, and, and that's why I think it's so important that the department beef up its resources um, to, and the, and the legislature help them beef up their resources to really do their job in the prior approval system. And it, it doesn't have to be, you know, dependent on an intervener. It, it shouldn't. It should be dependent on their own capacity to look at what the insurer's assumptions are. And that's, of course, another concern we have about the cap models is that it's very hard, you know, to peel back, well, wh wh how did they get to this number? Because for you, and, and, and the last thing I would say, you know, I'm in favor, uh, you know, having watched the flood program, which has, you know, you can only, the max you get is 250,000. Having watched um, the CEA, you know, they just had to reduce some of their limits. People, I don't want consumers to get lowered expectations of what they're gonna get, but I think a lot of people would rather get something than nothing. So maybe a little bit of um, developing a model basic policy uh, which we're supposed to have. I mean, that's what the fire policy is. It's just that this wildfire knit is throwing things out of out of whack. And the last thing I'd say is, you know, we do want to not pit different parts of the state against each other. There's been a lot of fighting in the coastal Gulf Coast states between inland and coast, and we're all, we all are in this. Pe listen, people who live in the city like to go to Tahoe. Okay, so it's really um, re insurance works best when it's spread. And you see what happens. We, we cut out earthquake and then no one buys it because it's too expensive. So we don't want to cut out wildfire um, in, unless we have you know, some, some better idea. There's some agents that are proposing this idea that the fair plan be only wildfire, um, that we take wildfire out of the basic policy. And, and, and again, I think anytime you segment, it makes insurance work less well and become more expensive. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if I might, I mean, I, I guess I'm struggling a little bit with some of the comments, this idea that, well, $1,000 what I used to pay and now 10000 doesn't seem fair. Because at the end of the day, actuarial science is a science. Insurance is about pricing risk. 
it's not a what feels right to me as a fair price based on what I had paid five years ago. I mean, prior to 2017, wildfire wasn't even a thing for insurance. It was a, practically a giveaway in your insurance policy. No one ever imagined a $15 billion loss in California. It never happened in history. Uh, and then to have it back to back was unthinkable. So, you know, th there's a lot of catching up that is going on right now in a market that was really wildly, in hindsight, underpriced. And consumers are getting this rate shock, and, and no one likes it. Um, insurers don't like it. This is not a happy time for insurers. I, I, I assure you that if we could go back to 2016 and not be talking about cap models and not be talking about reinsurance and, and not be having these hearings and not have you hear from your constituents, we would be quite happy to go back to that as well. And it's just unfortunate that that's not where we are and we have to come up to this new reality, this new climate change. I mean, the, the, you know, we talk about these cap models as if they're mysterious things. Um, the California Earthquake Authority, uh, which Mitch, Ms. Bach referred to, the governor, the insurance commissioner, and the state treasurer are the board of the California Earthquake Authority. They're having the exact same problems. This is not some for-profit entity. They're having the exact same problems that the admitted market is having hard reinsurance costs, their exposure growth is through the roof. They're having look at double digit rate increases. This, you know, it's, it's, it's not like this is a made up thing. Um, I, this might not be a cold comfort, but at least I'll say relative to Florida, you know, your concern there, um, the hurricane losses um, dwarf wildfire losses in California. Um, you know, it, it doesn't make wildfire losses any better. But I mean, when they're looking at, you know, we're looking at, you know, oh, since 2020, you know, 20 to $50 billion in losses in wildfire, they're looking at 100 to 200 billion of losses uh, from hurricane. And then of course, Ms. Collins' point about, they have an entirely different issue going on with legal system abuse. I think they have 8% of all the homeowners claims in the nation, and they have 80% of the litigation. But, um, you know, I. And I know it's difficult, but I, as I've been thinking about this, um, I think what we need to start thinking about is you, first you, you have to think about insurance, uh, actual science. It's it's a it's a market signal about risk. It's how do you connect rates to the actual risk? Step one. Then you have a market. How you then get at this affordability issue, I think, is an, a critically important question for everyone, right? Because you can't have a product that no one can afford, but at the same time. You know, you California, we, how do we manage this? If the risk becomes so unaffordable, what does that mean? And in California, you know, one thing it does, you know, maybe better than any other state is you have an incredible safety net. You know, there's, there's ways to think about, you know, obviously in, the, in uh, covered California, you, there's premium subsidy programs. There's other ways for the legislature to think about the affordability issue and let the insurance be about the actuarial science and the pricing the risk. And then to I think Mr. Harrell's point and everyone's point here, the, the medium to longer term thing is we all agree we have to bend the curve in risk and loss. That's the only thing that's gonna bring prices down. All these tools to price risk are great. And then you can have a market and, and it, it may not be you know respectfully satisfying to have an insurance market, <laughs> but it's better than not having an insurance market um, but to really get at the, the medium and longer term affordability, it's all about bringing down that risk and loss curve. And I think, you know, we, we, we talked about, Mr. Winokur talked about, you know, you need to have 30% minimum herd immunity to have that be meaningful. You have to have this ongoing commitment. Um, it wasn't that long ago, there was virtually no state money for mitigation. Um, that became part of the cap and trade program only back in 2017. And I know, in fact, Assemblymember Wood was very important as part of the utilities uh, wildfire fund, driving uh, the Brown administration to make a larger commitment to wildfire resiliency with cap and trade funds. And it's just recently now that the budget's even looking at that. But now budget's tightening up. One of the first things to go in the budget this year was money for Cal Fire inspections, right? And they were only doing one third of the WUI every three years, and they weren't even, that was their 
what they were supposed to do, and they were barely hitting 15 or 20 percent of that. So this ongoing commitment, because you have to have the maintenance, it's not a one and done when you do your defensible space. I think the zero to five foot zone is incredibly important. The science that we see, that's one of the most meaningful things you can do. But this is all ongoing. It's like once you get it clear, you have to stay on top of it. And unfortunately, I think those are a lot of things that go when the budget times get tough. And then where does the money come from? And frankly, a lot of communities, your district was actually very good about approving, you know, taxing themselves to pay for mitigation. That's not the case in a lot of communities, even high fire communities up in the North State who said, no, we don't want to pay for mitigation. We don't want to tax ourselves for mitigation, but we don't want insurance to go up either. So now what happens, right? So thank you. I would say the one thing that I would add to that is that w with catastrophe models, it doesn't suddenly invent new risk. The risk is on the ground. It's a question of are we already able to price for that? And with the historic look back period as an example, there was insurance companies that had filings, I believe back in like 2015 or 16, that saw this growing risk, couldn't get a rate approved for that. Then the 17, 18 wildfires occurred and then you see this increase in the need for rate to be increased because now they can include it in their loss experience. They knew it was always there, but they couldn't price for it until it happened. And what you see as a result for consumers is now you have this knee-jerk reaction where now you gotta spike prices much higher, much more quickly. And I think that's the worst for, ins for any kind of consumer because as you're trying to manage your budget, it's a gradual increase is easier to absorb and plan for if you're buying a new home and what your budget's going to be monthly costs. When you get like a balloon payment like on a mortgage and suddenly you have to come up with all of that and that's not on your radar, that's more difficult and more of a financial destabilizer where it suddenly becomes un unaffordable for you. So there, there is gonna be growing costs. We aren't gonna sit here and tell you that that's not gonna be the case. Every state that I am working with is having these same conversations, unfortunately. But we can create more stability in how we gradually adjust to risk as a long term. This isn't just in the next couple of years, this is going forward with knowing our risk is going to continue to amplify as more of these climate conditions and more of these exposures of new communities in these areas continue to pose a threat where we have to continue to do reconstruction as these events do occur. So it's creating greater stability, not just for insurance companies and how they manage it, but also for consumers on what they should be anticipating from a cost and budget perspective. Uh, for, thank you. Um, this, is, this has been a very interesting discussion and uh, appreciate, appreciate it very much. Um, I kind of want to bring it back to kind of the bigger picture from, the, from what we're seeing in, in our world. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm a staff member. I hope I have the numbers right, but, um, but you'll, get the, you'll get the general gist of it. I think the insurance premium to cover their house and, and suburban part of, uh, or actually rural, more rural part of, of of California was $2,200. Um, that policy was canceled. They went to a fair plan, which ended up being $4,800 for less coverage, not, ro not complete coverage. And so for them, for that, for, for that person, the idea that a, if a plan went up 30 or 40 percent looks really appealing, $600, $700 more less than 3,000 versus 48, but I've got comprehensive coverage here. And so the idea that, that everything should be all focused on, you know, the rates and da 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 doesn't belie the reality of the market and what's happening in, 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 out there. And I appreciate consumer groups. I understand where you're coming from, but that's the reality of what a lot of people in, in my district are facing, are, this area are facing. No coverage going to, or going to the fair, and then go to the fair plan, pay huge amounts of money for less coverage. And that is the reality. So I'm appreciative that the, the, uh, the um, insurance commissioner now has, uh, through executive order, the ability to move forward. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen in a timely manner. He has until the end of December 31st of 2024. So I think part of us is to keep the feet to the fire to actually move things more quickly. Because even with those in place, 
when do you see as the market, when do consumers see the relief potential of a stable market? Because we need competition. We need as many plans in the mix as possible. Less competition, higher prices. We see that in everything. The more competition there is, the more chance we have to get a rate that, that actually works. So realistically, tough question for the insurance company representatives here and, and won't hold you to it, ballpark um, sort of idea. But the, as these tools become available, um, do you think, number one, that creates the stability you're, you're looking for? And number two, when, how long after regulations are out there do you think that that stability will translate to you know, availability for consumers so they're not forced into the fair plan? I, I think what you've just described is that competition is your best solution. When you put all of these higher risk properties into a fair plan, it's naturally going to be much higher. And so for those residents in those high risk areas, I, I live in El Dorado County, so I'm just in that same region as well. You want the private market access. And to get the private market access in these regions is where companies are saying, we need that regulatory flexibility and ability to reflect the cost of claims. The first and foremost option that our members express is, is the timely approval of rate changes. So we've had this influx of inflation after they've tried to recover from these catastrophic losses of 17, 18, and other recent years. So trying to just get close to rate adequate, it may not be the extent of what you see in the fair plan, but for a private company, like just getting those closer to what their indicated need is. The reinsurance and the catastrophe models are another tool to help you get there. And so they're kind of like a second layer that works together with that. And so the catastrophe models help inform what that risk is going to be, how to do it over time, what your overall concentration is going to be, and then the reinsurance can then help provide the additional capacity to write in those high risk areas. If you don't have that market capacity through other financial mechanisms, whether it's catastrophe bonds or reinsurance, that's where that rate increase by the primary company has to keep pace with that. So just the rate approvals, which are what we are working closely with Commissioner Laura on, is the very first line of defense that will get it there quicker. The, the regulations which allow the use of the reinsurance and the cap models do need to go through their regulatory process, and those would take a little bit longer, but those are kind of like the top three, essentially, if you were to try to prioritize what those would be, at least from our perspective. Sarah, not if you have others to add. Well, I was just going to add, yeah, let me do my Karnak, this date, give you a date, and then... Um, get in a lot of trouble uh, later. <laughs> um, I do, on that, on that point, I think there is a, a piece that, that's happened that's really important. I mean, obviously it's hard to know, and I, I don't know the extent, the extent to which the department has been impacted by, you know, there were COVID retirements, the skill set of having actuaries and people who know how to do rate filings. It's not a lot of people, you know, coming out of college going, I can't go wait to work at the Department of Insurance to do rate filings. Um, so they have to staff up for that. You know, Ms. Ms. Box sort of alluded to insurer foot dragging. I don't, I don't think that's the case. There's hundreds of filings sitting there for discounts, uh, but I think the department needs that help. Now, what a lot of people, the press isn't talking about a lot, but that's really important. Um, in one of the, the last budget bills that the legislature passed, was a language and authority for the Department of Finance to work with the Department of Insurance to bring in contract staff to add bodies. Insurers pay, we, and we told them, said, and Department of Insurance is all funded by fees on insurers, um, hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And we said, well, what do you need? How about, we'll pay for it, go get all the staff you need to move this stuff along. And so um, I think that is the key. It's, it's getting them the resources because I believe the commissioner and the senior leadership there is dedicated to addressing this problem. Obviously, he's made some very public commitments about getting at that, um, and so they need to have those resources. And as, as much as we're all focused on the cap models uh, and reinsurance issues, as, as uh, Ms. Collins was talking about, just that simple day-to-day -day getting those things moving could be really meaningful. I, I wish I don't I don't have a sense of what 
the pool of people or the ability to contract for that is or, or exactly what the workload is. I, and again, I don't speak for the department. I know they recently actually already put out a, uh, an RFO where they're requesting for an analysis of you know, what's our workload need and how are we gonna get there? How are we gonna start hitting? In Prop 103, it talks about actually 60-day approvals. Um, and, then, and then if you go to administrative hearing, 180 days, right? We've never even come close to anything like that. So if those are the new targets and they start staffing up to that, we could see meaningful movement happening quickly. But, but the truth is it's taken us many years to get into this problem. Um, and, and as typical with complex problems, um, it's probably not something that turns around in a week or a month. Uh, but certainly we would hope we're gonna see meaningful progress well before December of 2024. Just a, a quick note of maybe positivity. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we want to scapegoat the prior approval process or the intervener process. Those are, I don't think those are the causes. I think those are something that the insurers have been complaining about from day one. Um, I have heard this week two, two good rumors that we like. One is that the reinsurance market is predicted to soften in the spring, so that is good. I've also heard that a major insurer has um, just said a, at an agent briefing last week said that they are going to open up some zip codes. So I mean, I think a lot of us when we saw this Memorial Day announcement, we were like, okay, this is political. Like, like you're going to make this announcement on a three, you know, three day weekend. And there were there were a lot of insurers that have been quietly quitting the market. You probably know that. And so we just heard a few high profile. We do have a really pressing situation. If you look at how many. Uh, applications the fair plan is getting every day it's scary and I know you know that that's why we're here so um, I just really appreciate your time I do think that insurers will get thirsty again for the premium dollars um, for sure um, but I still think we have to be working on a plan B so we don't find ourselves in a situation long term Assembly member Wood and others if I might just very briefly I know it's it's gone long although I feel like it's been a hopeful productive conversation, an interesting one. Um, I'll, let me begin on a positive note. Um, I, I think we all agree on resources for the, for the department. Um, look, I was there for almost six years. Um, those are good people. They work hard. Uh, it's, um, it, you know, it doesn't have the allure, as, as Mr. Taylor just kind of alluded to, uh, that, that some other places do. But they do good work, and, and they, they really do work hard for the people of the state. Um, so I don't think anyone disagrees with, with more resources there. Uh, it's, it's a question of kind of making that happen uh, in, a, in a thoughtful way. Okay. Um, on uh, Ms. Bach's reinsurance rumor, um, if I had a nickel for every time an unregulated industry started to hear rumors about the potential for regulation or people looking at it and then made an announcement that maybe the market might soften up, I'd be a rich man. I wouldn't have to work for the consumer Fed, although I probably would help them out anyway. So I take all that with a grain of salt. I hope she's right. Um, I can tell you, uh, Assemblymember Rodriguez, you know this better than almost anyone in this room. CEA, and, and, and Saren mentioned it, CEA is just at the mercy of the reinsurance industry. And there's a whole other conversation, obviously, about earthquake and the number one thing that increases take-up rate of earthquake insurance is, guess what, a big quake. And of course, it's too late for anybody who was damaged in the big quake. But um, that is, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. And, and by the way, we appreciate uh, going back years, and I was still at the department when this started, all the work that you've done on Brace and Bolt. Brace and Bolt is the mitigation version in earthquake, a variation of the conversation that we've just had for, for the better part of the past three hours here. Um, rate filings. I would not be doing my job if I didn't mention that while I did not personally work on rate filings when I was at the department, I wasn't personally looking at them or reviewing them, I obviously was talking to the people who were. Um, while I don't want to pay with too broad a, broad a brush, what was not uncommon at all, what was quite common was a rate filing would come in from an insurer and it would ask more questions with the incompleteness of the filing than it would answer in the filing. The department doing yeoman's work would then work very hard to try to work through that and ask those questions. Those questions would then be submitted back to the insurer, crickets. And then the insurance industry tends to, not always, in fairness, tends to say, 
look at the delays at the department. Many of those problems could have been avoided with a more thorough, more comprehensively written, better quality rate filing to begin with. That's what I saw. Now, things maybe are a little different now, I don't know. The other thing that I know is that for the past few years, there has been kind of a green light on rate filings. Um, they are getting moved through pretty quickly. They're getting approved. It, the data is overwhelming. Insurers are getting, I believe, Amy, it's about 95%, give or take, of what they're asking for. And, and so this demonization of, you know, kind of people who are just doing the best they can with limited resources and the intervener process, I think is unfair. Um, that's, a, that's a debate that's been going on for 35 years since Prop 103 first passed in 88. But I do think that um, there are a number of takeaways for all of you where there are opportunities to move forward to help consumers. That pain in those communities, as some member would, that's real. And, and we understand that and feel that too. We just wanna make sure that there isn't such a waving of transparency and fairness. And we have you know, rules and prior approval that have historically, and there's many reports on this, saved consumers billions and billions of dollars and really helped them. And then that's not important that we kind of throw that out. Uh, but that doesn't mean that anything, no system is perfect, and we'd be the last people to say that. So thank you very much for the time and the question. <laughs> and on that, it's not perfect. <laughs> well, this has been incredibly helpful, great discussions and great questions. So I'd like to thank my colleagues, and especially as someone would for offering to host uh, here in his district. I, th I think this has been one of the most successful hearings we've had this year, actually. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Damon. Thank you all so much. Yeah, and I want to echo that as someone who represents the district like a half mile away. So much appreciated. And thanks uh, to the chair and Assemblymember Wood and our other colleagues. So we're going to open it up to public comment now. Um, if folks would like to uh, speak on these issues, um, please come forward and we would ask, um, where do we have the mic? There it is. Uh, if you could start lining up in front of the microphone and maybe try to keep your comments to a couple minutes if you can. Welcome. Hello, my name is James Ely. I'm an actuary uh, with 40 years of experience, somewhat uh, semi-retired, mostly retired underutilized, might be interested in some of that work, but um, I wanted to comment on, um, on two things, first of which um, is the catastrophic modeling, cat modeling. It's, it's well proven in, and, and very successful in hurricane modeling and, and also uh, earthquake, but uh, both can be modeled essentially as events as circles and and they hit on coastlines or fault lines. And so the modeling in that sense is relatively easy. Um, in uh, wildfire modeling is far more complicated and, um, and, and, and getting any real transparency is going to be extremely problematic. Um, there are two types of modeling. One type uh, involves identifying uh, individual risks, individual locations or communities and, and scoring them. And there seem to be a lot of um, confusion on the panel that, that, or an expectation that prospective modeling would mean that we would be uh, do a better job at identifying which locations or insureds deserve a discount. You don't need cat modeling for that. You don't need, you didn't need cat modeling to give you a, uh, an anti-lock brake credit on your car. So um, let's, cat modeling is about sizing up the total risk, the total dollars involved. Uh, don't think that cat modeling is about finding discounts. Cat modeling is about raising the prices. Uh, I, I say this, I, I am here as a consumer um, in, in Petaluma, currently under notice of cancellation. Um, now, I don't mean to just bag on the insurance company, but I, I, 
the representative of the department, I think he kind of soft peddled that element of it and, and talked about prospective modeling and in terms of discounts. Um, but at, when you talk about a, uh, a functioning insurance, mod, uh, in, insurance market, it does need higher prices. You're not going to have a functioning market. The current prices are too low. Um, the, um, and I don't have a stake in that. I don't own stock in any uh, personal lines, property casualty insurers in California. Um, but um, I say that as a consumer who wants to be able to buy insurance in a competitive market. Um, and, and know that that is going to be essential to, to the functioning of the real estate market long term as well. So, um, and I will take exception with the intervener process. The Prop 103 regulations work great for auto insurance. It's uh, the Prop 103 regulations describe short term models, wildfire, catastrophe modeling. Uh, for property is a long-term problem. So there are fundamental flaws with the Prop 103 methodology um, that actually could be fixed in transparent ways if you could get the people of California to vote on it. So we have a political problem. Um, you don't need a, a sophisticated cat model that can't be explained to anybody. Uh, what you need is a trend factor on the 20-year historical period. I'd prefer it for a 40-year historical period. Uh, and there are, that would be a simple, transparent solution that could get you part way there. Um, also, um, the, the second point, oh, also that just the trend period of five years uh, for the inflationary trend is, um, is too short as uh, some insurers will have tubs fire losses in the, at the beginning of their experience period now and we are seeing a downward trend in cost. That's ridiculous. You need a longer trend period. So there are some easily identifiable, identifiable problems with the Prop 103 methodology. As, only as far as it goes for homeowners insurance. I have no objection to, to the auto. Um, now, the intervener process um, makes it um, extremely difficult for insureds to catch up when they fall behind. And we are in a position where they have fallen behind, they cannot catch up the, uh, uh, because of the intervener process. So we're going to need to find more creative solutions that don't involve a uh, uh, a vote of the uh, citizens of the state. Um, some creative solutions, we, there was, Amy Bach talked about uh, maybe a new policy form. Well, if that policy form isn't subject to Prop 103, I'm all for it. Um, uh, we talked about a... Uh, um, if you can maybe wrap sure. up. Public models, I'm all for public models, but how, how do they fit in the Prop 103 framework? Um, you've got problems. Um, finally, one specific solution that may seem a little weird, um, the, right now the, um, the FAIR plan uh, assessments go to property insurance writers, which creates a vicious cycle as the market shrinks, their exposure, their fair plan exposure grows. You could um, disconnect that, break that cycle by rewriting the fair plan legislation to assign that risk to auto insurers. That would break the disincentive and allow people to write. Thank you. Thank you. Other members of the public. Okay, looks like that wrapped that up. All right, well, thank you again, everyone. Really appreciate uh, everyone coming out, those tuning in. Great discussion today, as Assemblymember Wood noted, this will be the first amongst many. 
uh, obviously a, a crucial topic and a complex one as we got a taste of today, but I think we uh, got a lot of great information. So thank you again.